The Angel Experiment The Firstborn Angels Humans have always believed themselves the focus of God's cosmic plan, but what if God actually made humans as part of his plan for angels, his firstborn creations? If angels came first, aren't they self-evidently more important? Why would God spend much more time and effort on the less perfect, second-born humans? Once God created angels, why did he need to make Adam and Eve at all? Angels were his priority, always first in his thoughts. Isn't it possible that humans were created only because they were essential to the development of angels? We, the members of the human race, are all intimately involved with angels, not in any spooky sense, but in a manner fundamental to the way our minds work. As will be shown in this book, we became conscious thanks to angels. They are now hidden from us in our unconscious, but are destined to emerge again in the near future to herald a new reality, that of super. Consciousness, paving the way for God consciousness. Angel-human hybrids. Will rule the world and usher in a golden age. Most people are familiar with the concept of a higher self that acts as our guardian angel. According to some mystics, the task of this higher self is to raise us up to enlightenment. But what if the real task is for the angelic higher self to come to enlightenment via mastering the troublesome, primitive, human lower self? We assume that the higher self is complete and we are incomplete, but what if the higher self is also incomplete and coming to perfection through us, through overcoming all of the obstacles to perfection and enlightenment that we throw up? Plato depicted the soul as a chariot, with a charioteer and two winged horses, one white and one black. The charioteer represents the rational aspect of the soul, the white horse represents spirit and energy, and the black horse represents desires and appetites. If we consider the charioteer as the higher self and the two horses as the lower self then the higher self cannot travel to heaven unless it can work. Out how to direct the two wild horses. The charioteer's rational faculties are not sufficient. He must learn to master the irrational, to step out of his comfort zone in his natural logical terrain. So it is with angels in their interactions with humans. Angels are ruled by their intellect, humans by their body. Plato said that it was the natural tendency of the soul to strive upwards towards heaven, but the black horse was determined to pull the soul downwards into carnality and lust, into the material world. The white horse could support either reason or desire. If it supported the black horse, the soul fell to earth, became trapped in a physical body and its wings were destroyed, i.e. it lost its angelic character. If it supported the charioteer, the soul would soar into the heavens. The whole of nature is dominated by the two conflicting forces of rising and falling, the heavenly and the earthly, the spiritual and the appetitive, intellect and stupidity. Gravity pulls us down. Levity raises us up. The Cosmic Experiment People imagine that we live in God's creation. In fact, we inhabit God's experiment. God created and destroyed a number of prototype Earths because they did not satisfy Him. The Jewish legend Haggadah says, Nor is this world, inhabited by man, the first Earth created by God. He made several Earths before ours, but He destroyed them all, because He was pleased with none until He created ours. God is said to be perfect. If a perfect being created this world, why isn't it a perfect world? Haggadah supports the idea of God as a scientist, an experimenter, someone who makes and unmakes worlds, in order to learn from his mistakes and arrive at better results. God does not create perfection. Rather, he experiments with it. He retains his best experiments and gets rid of his worst. God is dialectical. God's first living creations were the angels. However, they disappointed him because they were too perfect, made too much in his own image. Their free will was limited. They did not know how to be bad, to have a personality, to be individual. They were boring. God found it impossible to love his firstborn, and that caused him great distress. What should God do with creatures that displeased him? Wipe them out, just as he wiped out bungled worlds? Having created immortal souls, God couldn't then kill them, even if he wanted to. Therefore, he devised a new plan, to make the angels more interesting, 
to give them meaningful free will. As his instrument, he chose us. Human beings were designed as the vehicles through which angels could be corrected. Humans are an emergency repair. Kit for Angels To make his experiment even more special, God did not produce humans as a brand new life form. Instead, he made humans from creatures he had prepared earlier, from brute animals without consciousness. Out of all the animals on which he might perform the divine experiment, God selected a particular group of apes, the fifth ape. God was interested in accomplishing two tasks, making his chosen apes into conscious humans, and perfecting angels via humans. This is the remarkable story of God's grand, cosmic experiment. It's an experiment still in progress. And we are all its active participants. The Era of Angels Two souls, alas, dwell within my breast. Goethe, Faust Was there a time in human history when humans routinely interacted with angels? Religions are full of references to angels and demons. Are we to assume that all of the humans who believed without hesitation in angels and demons were insane, or delusional, or had enormously more vivid and fantastical imaginations than humans do now? It was only a few hundred years ago that women were being regularly burned as witches. Between 1450 and 1750 in Europe, some 50,000 witches were executed. Are we to dismiss this as a cultural aberration, or is there a stranger truth? Human beings have physically looked the same for many thousands of years. We need only glance at ancient statues to see how similar to us the ancients were. There is very little sense that humanity has physically evolved since ancient times. But what about mentally? How would we be able to tell from looking at Greek and Roman statues if the human mind was much the same then as it is now? Yet we can look at the writings of ancient humans and see that their conception of reality could scarcely be more different from that of modern science. This implies that they had radically different minds. If the humans of, say, 2000 years ago had been prototypes of Richard Dawkins, they would have been scientists, but with much less knowledge than scientists have now, yet with the same basic attitude. However, the humans of that period bore no resemblance at all to Richard Dawkins. Close to a 100% of humans were religious and spiritual, and had zero doubts concerning the existence of gods, angels and demons. Why were they so? Convinced of the reality of entities that are now routinely dismissed as absurd? We know for a fact that humanity was once universally obsessed with religion. Today, most of humanity is still religious, but many people are now, spiritual, rather than religious per se, and a sizable proportion is outspokenly anti-religious. Even many of the religious are lukewarm compared with the devout believers of ancient times. Most of Christendom in today's world appears happy to pay lip service to religion, but to live lives that show no real commitment to, and no real faith, in Christianity. Christianity is seen as a way to live respectably and with some sort of moral code, but the average Christian seems more or less indistinguishable from any average, secular non-Christian. Surely the gap between them ought to be vast and instantly obvious. Either non-Christians are unwittingly extremely Christian in their behavior, or Christians are extremely unchristian. In their overt behavior. How many people who profess to be Christian remind you in any way of Jesus Christ? How many of them remind you of petty, selfish, greedy, ruthless, nasty people who do anything to gain an advantage in life? Today's Christians, by and large, are exactly the kind of people the Christian Bible denounces and abhors. Are cultural changes responsible for all of this, or have substantive changes occurred in the human mind? To put it another way, is the human mind evolving unobservably yet radically, and could such evolution one day transform the human race? Could mental evolution, unlike physical evolution, happen rapidly, almost on a generation-by-generation -generation basis? Is the internet and smartphone generation significantly different from the preceding generation? Does technology alter the human mind? Did wheels, gunpowder, books, phones, televisions, cars, planes, computers, and so on, all bring about far-reaching mental changes? Does the loss of religion strangle hold over? The human imagination result from technological innovation that makes 
religions seem less magical and powerful? This book investigates the proposition that the human mind was once highly susceptible and open to real angels and demons, and remains so in many people, but that this capacity has been lost or suppressed in many people, yet could be regained in the right circumstances. To put it another way, the interaction with angels has never ceased, but it has taken on a wholly different character. For most people, our old life with angels is now buried in the unconscious. But there are ways to bring it back into consciousness and thus to herald a spiritual, angelic revolution. The key figure in the hidden angelic history of mankind is none other than Jesus Christ, perhaps the most misunderstood individual in history. Jesus was not a new type of Jew. He was in fact a representative of old Judaism, i.e. the Judaism that existed prior to the fall of Solomon's temple and the exile of the Jewish people to Babylon. Old Judaism was not monotheistic. It revolved around the god El, and his consort Asherah, the Queen of Heaven, the Council of Heaven, and the Archangels and the Heavenly Host of Angels. When El reigned supreme, Yahweh, the monotheistic god of post-exile Judaism, was only a minor figure in the pantheon. Later, he was merged with El to become a single all-powerful god. Israel features the name of El, not of Yahweh. According to some biblical scholars, Israel and Judah were two very different things, and indeed became formally separate kingdoms. From 1050 to 931 BCE there was a United Kingdom of Israel under a single monarch. In 931 BCE, the Kingdom of Israel split into two parts, one, the Kingdom of Northern Israel, Samaria, and two, the Kingdom of Southern Israel, Judah. Samaria lasted until 722 BCE, when it was destroyed by the Assyrian Empire, and Judah until 587 BCE, when it was destroyed by the Babylonian Empire. There can be little doubt that the two kingdoms had markedly different religious beliefs, which were the source of bitter conflict. Yahweh was the God of Judah and El of Israel. Later biblical writers then tried to create the illusion that they were one and the same monotheistic God, always loyally and faithfully worshipped by the Jews. This book will take you on a journey through the evolution of human consciousness. It will refer to brain structures, technology, psychology, angels and Jesus, and show how we can all have enormously more powerful minds, all the way up to the godlike mind of Jesus. The key to understanding the mechanism for angel-human interaction lies in the fact that the brain is hemispheric. Each hemisphere can be regarded as a brain in its own right. Wherever you have a brain, you also have a mind. Incredible though it may seem, a human actually has two brains and two minds, but, naturally, only one of these brains and minds can correspond to I. What, then, is the other brain slash mind? If I is our conscious mind, the other, the non-I, must be our unconscious mind. But what is the unconscious mind? If it's not I, how do we know that it's our mind? Consider a second possibility, we are designed to accommodate two persons, not one. One person is the physical person, the other person is the spiritual person, the angel. The physical person, human, is our lower self. The angel is our higher self, interacting with us behind the scenes, so that we barely notice it. Historically, this hidden presence was called the guardian angel. Socrates famously referred to it as his daemon, and he habitually looked to it, rather than himself, in the most trying times in his life. He always deferred to its decisions. Consider the command and control possibilities inherent in this dualistic human angel configuration. There are two basic scenarios. 1. Human in command, the angel serves the human, or is deemed non-existent. 2. Angel in command, the human serves the angel. The central thesis of this book is that humans now inhabit a type 1, world where many people discount the existence of angels. However, in ancient times, a type 2, world prevailed, where no one doubted the existence of angels. To type 1, humans, type 2, humans are crazy. To type 2, humans, it's the other way around. The ancients would regard us as madmen, or strange soulless zombies, cut off from true, spiritual reality. 
Psychologist Julian Jaynes controversially suggested that prior to the type of consciousness we enjoy today, humans had bicameral minds. He wrote, at one time human nature was split in two, an executive part called a god, and a follower part called a man. Neither part was conscious. Given a crisis situation, a bicameral man would not know how to act. He would have to wait for his bicameral voice which, with the stored-up admonitory wisdom of his life, would tell him non-consciously what to do. Jaynes portrayed the executive mind, the God, as a hallucinated voice. Heard by the follower mind, the man. But what if it wasn't a hallucinated voice, but, rather, an actual voice of a separate entity? In Jaynes's scheme, when man became conscious, the voice of the God vanished. His suggestion, based on a master-servant model, was as follows. Ancient bicameral man. Servant, unconscious man, with a voice. Master, unconscious God, with a voice. The God speaks to the man and controls him. Man worships God. Modern conscious man, master, conscious man, with a voice. Servant, unconscious God, without a voice. The God is silent. Man controls himself. Man denies God. This scheme raises two other evolutionary possibilities, superconscious man, servant, conscious man, with a voice. Master, conscious God, with a voice. God speaks directly to us, and we follow his instructions. Man is the protege of God. God man, servant, conscious God, with a voice. Master, conscious man, with a voice. We speak directly to our inner God, and he does our bidding, which means that we have become gods ourselves. God is the apprentice of man. We have suppressed the God slash angel inside us and made it silent. But what if we could make it speak again? Everything would change. We would have access to incredible, life-changing power and wisdom. Humanity would undergo the most dazzling metamorphosis. We could create heaven on earth. Jesus Christ is an example of superconsciousness. Here, in one body, was a man acting as the direct servant and agent of God. God and man were present at one and the same time. Jesus Christ had two consciousnesses operating in tandem. It must be emphasized that, in Jesus, the God consciousness was not always active. In fact, it usually wasn't. It expressed itself only at important times. It wasn't God that went to the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers. That was plainly an angry human. When Jesus called himself the Son of God, he was talking as a man who knew he was under God's direct, personal supervision. When, just before he died, he desperately cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's obvious that the God consciousness had removed itself, leaving the man bereft, all on his own. Jesus must have felt himself abandoned at the greatest crisis in his life. Since God can't die, God had to be absent in order for the man Jesus to physically die, so this detail, about Jesus seeming to have been forsaken at the point of death, is the most telling detail in favor of the reality of what happened. The dead man was then placed in the tomb, but was immediately reanimated, resurrected, as soon as the God consciousness returned to the body. At this stage, the man consciousness, as an independent entity, no. Longer existed, it had been fully absorbed into the God consciousness. This is what can happen to all of us. The resurrected Jesus still had his physical body, which he was able to show to his followers, even to the extent of allowing doubting Thomas to touch his physical wounds. However, when Jesus ascended into heaven, he of course couldn't take a physical body with him. Instead, it was his spiritual body that ascended, leaving behind his physical body, which was then entombed by his followers in a secret location. The ancient Egyptian depiction of the nature of a human being is relevant to this point. According to the Egyptians, a human was composed of a ka, physical body, a ka, spirit body, which was the immaterial body of the higher self, and ba, the man consciousness. When the ka died, the ba and ka survived and their task was to enter into union to form the ak, the entity that gloriously lived on in the afterlife. 
Jesus Christ had a human ka, physical body, a divine ka, spirit body plus, God consciousness, and a human ba, man consciousness. At death, his human ba was absorbed into his divine ka. At the ascension, the ka left behind the ka. Resurrection is not about a physical body coming back to life, it's about the soul escaping to the spirit body, the immaterial, double, of the physical body. Saint Paul wrote, there are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another and the stars another, and star differs from star in splendor. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, it is raised imperishable, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man Adam became a living being, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth, and as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. We have a perishable body for mortal life on earth, and a different imperishable body for immortal life in heaven. We are earthly man destined to become heavenly man. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of the famous fictional detective Sherlock Holmes, wrote, The physical basis of all psychic belief is that the soul is a complete duplicate of the body, resembling it in the smallest particular, although constructed of some far more tenuous material. In ordinary conditions, these two bodies are intermingled so that the identity of the finer one is entirely obscured. At death, however, and under certain conditions in the course of life, the two can divide and be seen separately. The ka is the physical body, and the ka is its spirit double. The ka is the man body, the ka the angel body. When the mortal human dies, his consciousness, ba, transfers to the ka, where it merges with the consciousness of its higher self, the angel. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. This is literally true in the sense that we have an angel or God inside us, with whom we can enter into union. All of us have a heavenly version of ourselves, whose job is to perfect the earthly version and make it eligible for immortality. Due to our stubbornness and stupidity, we may not listen to our higher self. Even worse, our higher self may have become corrupted and malignant, and we may listen to it all too eagerly. It might be a fallen angel, a devil or demon, seeking to have its evil fun through us as its worldly vehicle. Jesus was often called on to drive out devils that had possessed people. Why was Jesus able to perform miracles? Because an enormously powerful, God consciousness, was available to him, capable of exhibiting extraordinary mental control over matter, to the extent of allowing him to change water into wine, walk on water, and so on. He was able to bring Lazarus back to life by commanding Lazarus' angel to return to him. God and Jesus Picture by Gustav Dorr The Nephilim The concept of angelic consciousness residing in one hemisphere and human consciousness in the other helps to explain one of the most bizarre stories in the Bible that of the Nephilim, the giant offspring of the sons of God and daughters of men. Who were these sons of God? They were angels. In the Book of Enoch, they were called egregoroi, watchers, sent to earth to watch over humanity and be their mentors, guides and sages. However, some of them watched a little too closely and became obsessively enamored of their wards. Their lust caused them to succumb. These were none other than the fallen angels. It wasn't a case of the angels being a separate species from humans. Rather, they were humans, but with a right hemisphere mind belonging to a guardian angel. In fact, all human beings were of this kind, but some had far more powerful angelic minds than others. These were the dominant angels, and thus they were associated with dominant humans. There was no problem 
with angels and humans intermarrying since they all had human bodies, and were all of the same species. Their children, the Nephilim, were often arrogant and aggressive, hence their bad reputation. You can see something of the same phenomenon today in the behavior of super-rich, spoiled, pampered, narcissistic heirs and heiresses, with their distasteful sense of entitlement. The Fallen Angels Picture by Gustav Dorr The Fifth Ape What's the difference between humans, the so-called fifth ape, and the other four apes, orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees and bonobos? Why are we conscious while they are not? Is it because God chose to make us conscious, but not them? Were we led to consciousness not via our own efforts but by those of God's pre-existing conscious race, the angels? Neurologist Paul McLean proposed that humans have a triune brain, i.e. a brain with three distinct evolutionary parts. 1. A primitive brain concerned with self-preservation and aggression, with the four FS, fight, flight, feeding and fucking. 2 an intermediate brain dealing with emotions. 3. A rational brain dealing with thinking. McLean referred to the oldest structure as the reptilian brain, comprising the brain stem and cerebellum, the second brain as the limbic system, the old mammalian brain, and the third as the neocortex, the new mammalian brain. Although the three brains are connected to each other by nerves, to a high degree they act as distinct, autonomous units with their own specialized duties. Each brain might be said to have has its own intelligence, its own perspective. We could even say that each has its own mind. Although it might seem as if the most recent brain should control the older two, this is far from the case. The latest brain hasn't bedded in properly. The real controller is the oldest, most primitive brain, the reptilian human. Just look at the world around you. Don't humans seem much more like slimy lizards than shining angels? Moreover, in most people, the limbic system, the emotional brain, can easily hijack the higher mental functions. Reason and logic are swept away by an emotional outburst. Most people are ruled by primitivism and emotionalism, certainly not by rationalism. The reptilian brain is inflexible, obsessive, ritualistic, robotic, machine-like, instinctive and deeply paranoid, always having an eye to potential dangers. This part of the brain is necessarily permanently active, even during deep sleep. If it shut down, you would be dead. Most brutish, stupid, aggressive men operate at this level. The reptilian brain doesn't. Think, it just acts according to its hardwired programming. It's manically competitive, a real, jungle, creature. It deals only with me 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 behavior. In other words, it's the home of the Freudian ID and the anarchic law of the jungle. The limbic system is concerned with emotions and social adaptation, whether you feel positive or negative towards something. To the emotional system, everything is either agreeable or disagreeable. This system is obsessed with seeking to avoid pain and to repeat pleasure. Since it recognizes the needs of others, it has empathy and sympathy, it reflects the Freudian superego. In a sociopath, the empathy and sympathy are absent, so the sociopath cares only about his own pleasure and pain. This system has a flexibility and adaptability entirely lacking in the reptilian brain. McLean argued that feelings elude the grasp of the intellect, because their origins lie in primitive, evolutionary structures that long preceded the intellect and are not expressible in verbal terms. For McLean, the Organization of the brain accounts for the difference between what we feel and what we know. He wrote that the greatest language barrier lies between man and his animal brains, the neural machinery does not exist for intercommunication in verbal terms. According to McLean, the neocortex is a prisoner of the limbic system. The latter decides how it feels about something, and the neocortex is then required to rationalize that value judgment rather than arrive at its own rational values. The neocortex, the outermost layer of the brain, enables us to plan and engage in complex, abstract thought. It permits us to be creative, imaginative, rational, logical, and intuitive. This is where the Freudian ego, obeying the reality principle, has its home. Unfortunately, 
the neocortex also supports an unreality principle. Through the use of language, we can construct fictional universes, fictional beliefs, fictional religions, and fictional philosophies. In terms of the Jungian cognitive functions of thinking, sensing, feeling, and intuition, we might loosely say that the reptilian brain deals with sensing, the limbic system with feeling, the right hemisphere of the neocortex with intuition, and the left hemisphere of the neocortex with thinking, reasoning. A Jungian personality type is constructed from the relative importance that we assign to each of these components. A thinking type is much more reliant on the neocortex, while feeling types rarely stray from the limbic system. The reptilian brain is dogmatic, aggressive and always alert to threats. The limbic system tends to hijack thinking and make it do what the emotions want. The neocortex is forced to rationalize desires and feelings rather than exploring reason and logic. It's the lower rather than higher mammalian brain that is the seat of our value judgments. Humanity will not become sane until the advanced neocortex takes over from the limbic system. Equals 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 equals. The triune structure of the brain raises the issue of what parts of the brain are targeted by religion, economics, politics, advertising, and so on. You don't sell to people by appealing to logic and reason. You target the reptilian brain stem and limbic system. Similarly, irrational religious or political beliefs do not work at the level of the neocortex. Again, they are linked to the reptilian brain stem and limbic system. Muslim terrorists do not commit mass murder because they are rational, thinking types, but because their religious beliefs have locked them into their primordial brain stem. When you criticize Islam, a Muslim fanatic regards this as any animal in nature does when confronted by a deadly threat. The Muslim feels that his identity and survival are at stake, so he must retaliate with maximum, deadly force. Fanatical religions all revolve around the primeval brain stem. They deliver a stark, simple message, heaven or hell, life or death, that the reptilian brain understands perfectly. McLean's theory of a triune brain has been characterized in terms of a horse, mammalian limbic system, evolving on top of a crocodile, reptilian brain stem, with a computer, neocortex, evolving on top of the horse. So, at any one time, what is guiding you, the crocodile, the horse, or the computer? This is reminiscent of Plato's conception of the soul where reason, spirit and appetite are all in conflict. In the original Star Trek, Captain Kirk, Dr. McCoy and Mr. Spock resemble the components of the triune brain. Captain Kirk is the fearless, decisive man of action, the crocodile, Dr. McCoy the overly emotional, indecisive conscience of the trio, the horse, and Mr. Spock is the relentlessly logical and rational scientist, the computer. Kirk and Spock see everything in black and white, McCoy in every color. The thinking brain is not where decisions are made. This occurs in the Primeval brain stem, informed by the often hysterical limbic system. In most people, reason and logic don't get a look in. People simply don't think. Frequently, the thinking brain has no idea what's going on. It doesn't speak the same language as the limbic system and the brain stem. It has the same relationship to them as the conscious to the unconscious, as waking to dreaming. Interpreting the limbic system and brain stem is every bit as bizarre and problematic as interpreting dreams. Just as people invent interpretations of dreams, they invent interpretations of why their lower brains made them act as they did. In truth, they have no clue what's truly going on. The brain stem and limbic systems are in charge, and they don't use language, reason, and logic. The neocortex has to pretend it understands what is happening. Otherwise, it would be admitting that it's an ineffectual puppet. The neocortex is therefore the great mythos maker, the consummate liar. Its job is to invent reasons for why the person acted as he did. It creates a continuous narrative, but one that bears no resemblance to what really happened, which is why people rarely learn from their actions. The neocortex provides a never-ending retrospective story of our lives. It furnishes a rationalization and justification for decisions for which it was not responsible. Imagine how different the world would be if decision-making were transferred from the nonverbal, 
irrational brain stem and limbic system to the verbal, rational neocortex. Everything would change overnight. As things stand, how people think they will react to something is often radically different from how they will actually react, because it is not the thinking self that will be doing the reacting. What the thinking self will do is retrospectively justify why the brain stem and limbic system behaved as they did. You can never rely on what opinion a person gives when they are in their thinking mode. Their real behavior will be determined by their emotions, primordial desires and instincts. The limbic system can easily override higher mental functions, and the instinctual reptilian brain can easily ignore both emotion and logic. In the end, in the battle of the three brains, the reptile will always win. It's the entity that takes the final decisions, which has the last say. That's where our will, instincts and desires are stored. People do not act against their will, instincts and desires. They serve them. In the consumer game, customers don't care about the intellectual reasons for why they should buy from you. They will say they do, but they definitely don't. You sell to them by appealing to their emotions and primordial desires. Marketeers tell their clients to sell to the reptilian brain, allowing the message to sail right past the rational gatekeeper and reach the real decision maker, which isn't rational. The brain stem and limbic system think much faster than the neocortex, and they have a volume control. You can turn your anger up to 10, but not your reason and intellect. The volume of instincts, desires and feelings easily drowns out all rational and logical considerations. The brain stem and limbic system are disassociated from the concept of time. Whatever they want, they want it now. Now is everything. There is nothing else. The old brain structures aren't bothered about future planning or reflecting on the past. They are reacting to what is in front of them right now. They are governed by the present and to hell with the future, with consequences. People can kill in a road rage incident. Reason and logic are nowhere to be seen. The American police keep shooting people because they are overwhelmed by reptilian forces, which make them hyper-suspicious of everyone and hyper-aggressive. The limbic system and brain stem do not operate on the basis of true and false, right and wrong. Instead, they are ruled by pleasure and pain, safety and fear, and the increase or decrease in the feeling of power. These constitute an entirely different way of interfacing with the world. The three brains are, to a large degree, physically and functionally separate, and we have to pull off an ingenious conjuring trick to make it seem as though they are all working in harmony. The I does this by telling itself an uninterrupted story. When something bizarre happens, which the I can't explain, it then says, I wasn't feeling myself, I don't know what came over me, that's not the real me, and so on. It doesn't dwell on it since the implications are horrific. If the I isn't in charge, who is? The limbic system is so emotionally potent that it can make a person form a fanatical attachment to their beliefs regardless of whether those beliefs are true or false. The emotional content of the beliefs is what counts, not their truth content. Truth is irrelevant to emotion. It's said that some people can experience a feeling of immense conviction about an absolute truth, yet one that is unconnected with any particular idea or any specific thing whatsoever. If these people do then apply that feeling to something specific, they are absolutely convinced of that thing's truth simply because they have associated their internal feeling of truth with it. Many people regard feelings of certainty as much more real to them than certainty itself. A mathematical truth that is absolutely certain is just an abstraction to an emotionalist, whereas some absurd story that God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh is held up as an undeniable truth. How can you argue with such people when you are not dealing with anything rational, but with their innermost feelings? Feelings have overwhelming power, in a manner wholly and tragically divorced from reason and logic. Once a person has emotionally attached himself to an idea, it's astoundingly difficult to pull him away from it. He won't listen to rational argument. The only thing that will make him change his mind is an even stronger emotion. The neocortex is the slave of what lies beneath it. It needs to become the master if humanity wants a bright, healthy future. 
Two in one. Do you believe that you are alone inside your head? Well, here's a question for you. Who produces your dreams? Either you create your dreams or something that is not you creates your dreams. When you are awake, the external world, which is definitely not you, supplies you with the content for your mind. When you are asleep, something other than the external world is supplying the content. How does this thing construct the content? What intelligence is involved? After all, dreams aren't just random noise, or bizarre mental screensavers. They are definite stories, with a definite meaning, even if you can't readily discern it. You can see in your dreams. How is that possible given that your eyes are shut? In this inner world, created by some intelligence that is not yours, you can use inner senses, the counterparts of your outer senses. If this inner world, which needs no physical sense organs, is not made of atoms, what is it made of? And how does it manage to resemble the world of atoms so closely? If it is not something physical that is producing the inner world of dreams, what else can it be other than a mind? And if it's not your mind then what else can it be but another mind? The philosopher Bishop Berkeley said that the external world was nothing but an idea in the mind of God. Does God create the outer and inner worlds? Are your dreams communications from God? In Julian James's bicameral world, people were convinced that their dreams were a portal to the realm of the gods, from which messengers, angels, could come to give them messages. Angel derives from the ancient Greek angelos, meaning messenger, envoy, one that announces. Some people say that our unconscious produces our dreams, but even that is to grant that our unconscious mind is a separate entity, with its own agency and creativity, over which we have no control. But how do we know that our unconscious mind isn't a separate mind, belonging to someone else, such as God, an angel, or our higher self? God's Experiments The Bible is a story trying to convey complex truths. It's possible to uncode the story and discover the underlying reality. The biblical God is a timeless, spaceless, immaterial singularity, a being of pure energy. He makes the universe of space, time and matter out of his own energy. He makes it out of nothing, i.e. out of his own singularity self, which occupies no space. This creation event is the Big Bang. The universe then evolves according to the mathematical laws God has decreed. He can experiment with those laws and produce different kinds of universe. By several accounts, he experimented with many universes before arriving at ours. Once God made this universe, including its stars and planets, he could then allow evolution to take its course everywhere. On this planet, Earth, he found an abundance of animals and plants, none of which was conscious. To be in God's image means to be conscious, so, at this stage, nothing was like God. Many cultures speak of a golden age that happened long ago. The Bible, of course, talks of the earthly paradise of Eden. Is it possible that things were indeed much better in the past? Imagine that the first humans were a type of ape that God chose to make conscious via his own consciousness, i.e. all of these ape-like humans were like God because they were all under God's direct mental control, i.e. they were conscious through God. Everything was perfect and idyllic because God ensured that it was so. His divine will was present everywhere. Everyone obeyed God perfectly because they reflected his will directly. Humans were literally at one with the mind of God. They were extensions of him, i.e. God-humans. But, of course, they were not free. They exercised no free will. They were rather like simple dogs, obeying and loving their master unconditionally. This was a paradise insofar as God provided everything, but it was wholly God's creation and no credit could be given to humans themselves. God could have maintained Eden forever, but what was the point? God. The perfect scientist, the cosmic experimenter, wanted his creations to become perfect through their own efforts, in order to be true companions for him. He wanted them to act as gods, without any intervention from him. The true. God is never a jealous God, he wants others to join him in his divine world. How could his creations be perfect unless they arrived at perfection through their own will, rather than his? 
God had already created perfect beings, incorporeal angels. These two lacked any meaningful free will. God then took the momentous decision to allow the angels, rather than himself, to control the community of humans in Eden, and thus to exercise their own will as they saw fit. There were far more humans than just Adam and Eve, of course. The right cerebral hemisphere is the portal to the divine world of God and the angels. Imagine the ka, the double, attaching itself to the ka, the physical body. The ba, the human mind, speaks through the left hemisphere of the brain, leaving the right hemisphere available to the mind of the ka. If we simply equate the ka to an angel, a guardian angel, we might say, we have turned a mere human being into a human angel hybrid. This hybrid arrangement afforded the angels their first opportunity to directly experience the physical world and all the pleasures and temptations that come with it. God's initial plan was to carry out a test. He left 95% of humanity in their natural state and allowed only 5% to become human angel hybrids. He wanted these angels to be watchers, i.e., those who watched over supervised and guided humanity. His idea was that angels would become perfected through this process, and they would in turn lead humanity to perfection. Of course, even the best plans can fall foul of the law of unintended consequences. It transpired that one-third of the Watchers fell hopelessly in love with the new reality that had opened before them. They coveted the power they enjoyed over humans. They loved making humans do their bidding and they lusted after the most beautiful humans. They ceased to reflect God's will and moral code and instead implemented their own. This is the root of the story of one-third of the angels of heaven rebelling against God. They succumbed to their ego and selfishness and fell from their lofty divine station. They cared only for themselves and not about God or humans. They were led by the brightest angel, Lucifer, later rebranded as Satan. They set up their own power base on earth. Eden was no longer godly. Because of the bad angels, the serpents, humanity was banished from the paradise it once enjoyed. The tale of Adam and Eve and their disobedience in the Garden of Eden is a garbled version of these events. Adam and Eve stand for ordinary human beings. The serpent that tempts Eve represents Satan and his watchers, human angel hybrids. They offered ordinary humans secret knowledge and power if they joined and served them. These events were transformed into the famous mythos of Adam and Eve being tempted to eat of the forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge. The Tree of Knowledge Picture by Gustav Dorr The fallen watchers seduced humans and had children with them, i.e. the sons of God, mated with the daughters of men. Their offspring were neither humans nor watchers. They were the hybrid race of superhumans, called the Nephilim. They were much taller, smarter and more dominant than ordinary humans. The Bible says that under their influence the world became utterly corrupted, to God's horror. He hadn't expected meaningful use of free will to result in such terrible behavior. So, he then took the fateful decision to kill everyone in the Great Flood, bar the last pure humans, Noah and his family. The last of the human race were placed in the Ark of Humanity, and saved from the catastrophe, ready to build a new world. The Ark Picture by Gustav Dorr God devised a new plan for humanity. He believed that they must be brought to perfection through a process reflecting their own nature. The triune brain, with its three distinct parts, implied that humanity should go through three different phases. With reference to the Bible, we might call these 1. The Old Testament, 2. The New Testament, 3. The Unwritten Final Testament, the Second Coming. The Old Testament is all about the reptilian aspect of humanity. It's about fight or flight, rigid obedience to the law, severe punishment for breaking the law, ubiquitous paranoia, and violence. The world resembles that of crocodiles, all furiously snapping at each other. There is precious little love and compassion. Life in the Old Testament world is nasty, brutish and short. Everything is black and white. Everyone is a fanatic. God communicated his message to reptilian humanity through prophets. These were the new face of the watchers of old. God chose 
special angels to inhabit human bodies and to tell humanity what he expected from them, and what punishments they would receive if they failed to obey. Then the time came when the message needed to change. A new testament was required. This time, God took the most momentous of decisions. Just like the watchers and the prophets, he himself took up residence inside a human. Specifically, Jesus Christ, in order that he could fully experience the human condition. Jesus was intended to reflect the limbic system rather than the reptilian brain stem. He was to emphasize emotion over mere survival and obedience. Above all, he was to stand for love and compassion, for altruism and charity. If the brain stem ideology of the Old Testament was saturated with the instinctive Freudian ID, the limbic system ideology of the New Testament was much more about the Freudian superego, others always come first, do unto others as you would have them do unto you turn the other cheek. The final testament is where the neocortex comes into its own. It's all about reason and logic, about humanity escaping from its reptilian core, its limbic system stories and emotions, and learning to think correctly, in the best interests of individuals, and the community of which they are part. We might say that the Old Testament was about God the Father, God. Remote from humanity, the New Testament about God the Son, God inside an actual human being, and the final testament about God the Holy Spirit, God inside everyone in the form of logos, reason and logic, connecting everyone rationally rather than emotionally, rather than in terms of blind obedience and faith. The second coming will be an enlightened age of reason, not an age of faith. It will happen when humanity is finally ruled by its neocortex rather than limbic system and or reptilian brain stem. Everything will be fair and just because that's the inevitable outcome of people operating according to reason rather than their emotions and desires. The second coming will be a second and final enlightenment. The first enlightenment went wrong because it was overtaken by Newtonian scientific materialism and empiricism based on experiments and the irrational senses rather than Leibnizian scientific idealism and rationalism based on reason and logic. The Newtonian system inevitably leads to atheism, although. Ironically, Newton himself was a true believer, an alchemist and mystic. However, the vast majority of those who took up his approach endorsed atheism. Materialism must be swept away by idealism, and empiricism by rationalism, before humanity is at last rational and logical. You cannot become rational by elevating the senses to the position of ultimate arbiter, as scientific materialists do. You must make reason itself the supreme judge. Scientists claim that anything that contradicts the fallible, unreliable human senses is false. In fact, it's anything that contradicts reason that is false. Science frequently makes claims that contradict reason. Reason appears in science only thanks to mathematics, which is immaterial and non-empirical. Descartes, a great rationalist philosopher, famously stated that the one sure fact is that we exist because we are thinking, I think, therefore I am. This, in fact, is a statement of empiricism, i.e. we exist because we are having a mental experience. What Descartes ought to have realized is that more fundamental truths are available. Namely, if thinking exists, there must be an ontological substratum that supports thinking, unless we are to regard thinking as magical and miraculous, grounded in nothing. Equally, if experiences exist, there must be a foundation for experiences. What conveys experiences? How do they interact with each other? What are the laws of thoughts and experiences? Descartes' famous statement therefore simply begs the question. It points to a deeper order of existence that allows thinking and experiences to exist in the first place. Rationally, I think, therefore I am, presupposes necessary existence. If things don't exist necessarily, they therefore exist without necessity, hence without a rational and logical basis. They can jump into existence out of nothing, for no reason. They are magical and miraculous. Nothing can guarantee their continued existence since if they came into existence out of nothing, they can just as easily vanish back into nothingness. An empiricist has no problem with the rational impossibility of things springing into existence out of nothing. 
Indeed, most scientific materialists and empiricists openly proclaim that the Big Bang universe erupted out of nothing. To any rationalist, however, this is absurd and intellectually offensive. Existence must be grounded in reason and order to be rational, explicable, logical, and intelligible. Miracles and magic are strictly forbidden. Any argument that relies on rational impossibilities is ipso facto false. Scientists like to say that anything not forbidden is compulsory. Well, for the universe of existence to jump out of non-existence is forbidden in every conceivable way, hence it cannot happen under any circumstances. Only two things are capable of having necessary existence, God and mathematics. Any proposed rational universe must be grounded in either God or the God equation. Adam, Eve and the Watchers Picture by Gustav Dorr the Three Ages The radical 12th-century theologian Joachim of Fiori believed that history reflected the Holy Trinity, hence was divided into three epochs. 1. The Age of God the Father, corresponding to the Old Testament. This was about humanity's obedience to the laws of God. 2. The Age of God the Son, corresponding to the New Testament, when man became the Son of God, or God became the Son of Man. 3. The Age of God the Holy Spirit, corresponding to the Final Testament when the whole of mankind comes into direct contact with God. The Kingdom of the Holy Spirit will be based on universal love. Only in this third age will God's Word be properly and fully comprehended. Society will be perfected. We shall live in heaven on earth. Consciousness is that which science calls that the psyche not merely a question mark arbitrarily confined within the skull, but rather a door that opens upon the human world from a world beyond, now and again allowing strange and unseizable potencies to act upon him and to remove him, as if upon the wings of the night, from the level of common humanity to that of a more personal vocation? C. G. Jung, Modern Man in Search of a Soul If we are the fifth ape, why aren't the other four apes conscious? If consciousness is such an invaluable evolutionary tool, why haven't the other apes evolved it? If we have a common ancestor with the other apes, why are we so staggeringly different from the other apes? Isn't it as if something exceptional intervened with regard to our particular ape, and radically transformed it? Humans were simply an ape picked out by God as the creature with the most potential. God, not evolution, made us conscious. After all, evolution has not made the other apes conscious. Guardian angels then helped to develop that consciousness. Originally, we were guided by voices. Angelic voices. God spoke to us in God language. Angels then taught us angelic language. There are those who say they have discovered mysterious ancient texts written in angelic script. Secret societies claim to possess them and to be able to wield the secret knowledge they contain. The Fall Many of the angels that were first assigned to the project to make humans conscious became carnal. They lusted after everything, sex, luxury, and power. More than anyone else, it was the angels who ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and many chose the evil rather than the good. Evil was so much more fun. They thereby brought about the banishment of humanity from Eden. Look at the world today. Isn't it still under the power of the fallen angels? They are now called bankers, CEOs, the super-rich, presidents, celebrities, and so on. Brain Stem World Most humans, even in the present day, are ruled by the primordial, reptilian brain stem. The reptilian brain leads to an ID world, a game theory world of selfish individuals ruthlessly competing with each other to be top dog to have access to the best and most desirable resources. Altruism is in staggeringly short supply. The world of the Old Testament is ruled by the brain stem, by violence, wrath, primitivism, fanaticism, submission to dominance, slavish obedience to masters, fear, inflexible rules and laws. And just look at modern-day Islam. Limbic System World Jesus Christ intended to bring about a world of love rather than law. The limbic system was supposed to take over from the brain stem, and humanity was supposed to move up a notch. Jesus failed. The brain stem world has not been displaced or replaced. 
capitalism is simply its latest and most insidious expression. Many matriarchal societies exhibit limbic system behaviors, while patriarchies are invariably brain stem systems. The reptiles are still in charge. Conspiracy theorist David Icke even claims that the world is ruled by alien, shape shifting, pandimensional reptilians called the Illuminati. Neocortex World Neocortex world is where man enters the world of his own devising, a world of computers, machines, medicines, and technology. Although today's world has these things, it's still overwhelmingly inhabited by brain stem and limbic system humans. Rational, logical people are exceptionally thin on the ground. The neocortex is, at present, a servant of the limbic system and brain stem. It's far from being the master, yet that's exactly what it must become if humanity is to reach its full potential. Modern consciousness has arisen through the left hemisphere of the brain, which supports reason and logic, yet, as Julian Jaynes pointed out, this is laid over an ancient bicameral mentality that can break through at any time. Modern consciousness suppresses the channel through which voices speak to us. However, conditions such as schizophrenia show how easy it is for the voices to return and be heard resoundingly. Even a hypnotist can readily suppress consciousness and put a subject fully in bicameral mode, obeying his master's voice. Only via the neocortex is genuine consciousness possible. Animals can't be conscious because their neocortex is so poorly developed. Stupid, overly emotional human beings, driven by their desires and instincts, also have retarded neocortexes, and are little different from animals. For humans to become superconscious, they must develop the neocortex to the uttermost extent, and thus acquire the power, knowledge, reasoning and understanding of the gods. In the first phase of its escape from the emotional limbic system and the primeval brain stem, the neocortex allies itself to the senses, and thus we see the rise of atheistic scientific materialism and empiricism, since all non sensory factors, of which religion is full, are rejected. Religion and spirituality are denied and derided. However, as the neocortex becomes more advanced, it embraces reason, logic and mathematics, and, amazingly, discovers that these are the rational basis of religion and spirituality, they can easily and naturally accommodate non-sensory factors. Sensory science will eventually give way to rational mathematics, and humans will become people of reason and logic rather than people of the senses, emotions, instincts, and mystical intuitions. This will constitute, so to speak, a fourth age. The Enigma In the time of Jesus, people were either fantastically imaginative compared with the people of today, much more willing to accept the reality of magic, miracles, gods, devils, angels and demons, or something has fundamentally changed in the human mindset, i.e. the nature of consciousness has profoundly altered over the years. Scientific materialism is perfectly willing to contemplate physical evolution of the human body, but it has never once directed any attention to mental evolution and the evolution of consciousness. Consciousness is taken as a given, i.e. all humans have always been conscious, not as something that has a history, a genealogy that we can study just as we can study old archaeological ruins. Science is unable to investigate mental evolution since it fundamentally rejects the mind as a real entity in its own right. The mind is regarded solely as an epiphenomenon of matter. It could not exist, so the materialist argument goes, without a material substrate. Therefore, all that counts are changes in the organization of matter. Hence, if material organization does not change, i.e. there is no physical evolution, there can be no mental evolution as far as science is concerned. In terms of scientific rationalism and idealism rather than scientific empiricism and materialism, it's mind, not matter, that is the primary reality, and evolution is fundamentally mental rather than physical. A mind can evolve in an instant, by absorbing an immensely powerful new idea that fundamentally changes its worldview. Scientific materialism can offer no insights into the mind since the mind is not something defined within scientific materialism, and never can be. The Triune World The brain stem, fight, flight, feeding and fucking. Religious metaphor, God the Father, the Old Testament, Jews. The Limbic System, Love, Hate, Pleasure, 
pain, happiness, sadness, content, discontent, hope, anxiety, heaven and hell, faith and nihilism. Religious metaphor, God the Son, the New Testament, Christians. The neocortex, reason, logic, mathematics, metaphysics, philosophy and science. Religious metaphor, God the Holy Spirit, the dialectical geist, mind-slash-spirit, posited by Hegel. New Humanity Scientific Atheism, the Non-God Mathematical Religion, the God Equation God the Computer, the laws of mathematics and science treated as abstractions God the Organism, the laws of mathematics and science treated as being built into life and mind, indeed synonymous with life and mind Adam and Eve God spoke directly to Adam and Eve they obeyed him perfectly. They had no free will. They were extensions of God, divine puppets. Adam and Eve lived in terrestrial paradise, Eden. They were incapable of disobedience. To all intents and purposes, they were robots, golems. In Jewish folklore, a golem is an animated anthropomorphic being, Wikipedia, then God allowed a second voice to be heard, that of the serpent. It had very different things to say, and radically different knowledge to impart. When Adam and Eve listened to this different voice, encouraging them to do things other than those mandated by God, they were metaphorically eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The Divine Communication Channel Everyone has a communication channel in their right hemisphere by which they can contact the whole universe. Via this channel, angels can talk to humans. Ultimately, this channel is a God portal, giving us access to divinity. David Reisman In his seminal work The Lonely Crowd, David Reisman discussed three main sociological types, tradition-directed, inner-directed, and other-directed. He described the evolution of society from a tradition-directed culture, defined by preceding generations, obeying the rigid rules established by past generations, to inner-directed, whereby people live not by the rules of the community, but of their parents, whose values they internalize as their own, they rigidly live in their adult lives what they learned in childhood from their parents, just as tradition-directed types rigidly live what they learned from their communities, to other. Directed, whereby people live according to the values of their peer group, hence are much more adaptable and prone to the latest fashions, fads and trends. Tradition-directed people define themselves according to how their community lives. Inner-directed people live according to how their family lives and other directed people ignore community and family and instead are shaped by their peers especially their friends and those with whom they aspire to be friends in terms of the triune brain tradition and inner directed types are governed by their brain stem the tradition directed types have so to speak a group brain stem while the inner directed have a family or individual brain stem other directed types are firmly under the control of the limbic system a fourth type of person, the autonomous, defined not by his community, family, or peers, but strictly by himself, is defined by the neocortex. The autonomous are the rational, logical people. The future belongs to them. One day, the whole of humanity will be autonomous. No one will be pressured by their community, family, or friends. Tradition-directed types are horrifically inflexible. They do not wish to be shamed in front of their community by breaking any laws. Inner-directed types are inflexible too. They do not wish to be shamed in front of their family. Other-directed types are hyper-flexible, but only because they are so keen to avoid being shamed in front of their peers by not being up to date with the latest interests of their group, which would render them not cool. They will do anything to accommodate others, to gain approval, so if their friends change all of their values, so will they in order to fit in, meaning, of course, that they have no core values, bar those of doing anything to avoid being excluded from the group. Large capitalist organizations overwhelmingly prefer other directed types, because they are obsessed with the latest consumer trends and fashions, and changing technology and lifestyles, specialist companies prefer inner. Directed types, and religions favor tradition directed types, religion would be. Nothing without tradition it would turn into subjectivist, relativist, spirituality, and Eastern mysticism and mumbo-jumbo. 
Reisman wrote, the other directed person wants to be loved rather than esteemed. Other directed people need to be constantly reassured that they are in tune with others. Nothing is more disturbing to them than the idea of loneliness, of ostracism from the group. They will do anything to avoid that fate. In past times, people defined themselves with regard to institutions, religions and political movements. Now they define themselves in terms of consumerism, fashion, objects, status symbols, and relativism. They have no ability to know themselves, to know who they really are. Reisman pointed out that other directed types lack autonomy. They are always compromising with others and have no values of their own. Reisman observed that leadership is in short supply in other directed societies since leadership involves taking unpopular stances, and no other directed person wants to be unpopular. By the same token, other directed types are opposed to knowledge, since it cuts them off from their peers, hence are incapable of maximizing their potential. Institutions prop up the various sociological types. If you want to change society, you must abolish the institutions that support the tradition directed. The conservatives, the other directed, the liberals, and the inner directed, the libertarians. We need institutions that exclusively promote autonomy. Brain stem. Inner directed, tradition directed, regimented, fixed. Limbic system, other directed, flexible, adaptive. Neocortex, autonomous. God and the angels. Angels became conscious through God. He gave them his own language. However, once he left them to develop on their own, they abandoned his language and invented their own. God realized that their minds could not cope with his perfect language. Imperfect minds need imperfect languages. That's why people hate math. The same thing happened with humans. In Eden, they initially knew the language of God, when he spoke directly to them. Then they were taught the language of angels. Finally, they invented their own languages, full of errors and delusions. The Mythos Species versus the Logo Species There are two species of human beings, those guided by stories, based on emotional words, and those guided by measurements, based on non-emotional numbers. The first is the Mythos Species. They are religious and spiritual. The second is the Logo Species. They are scientific, mathematical, and philosophical. The mythos species forms the overwhelming majority. Humanity will not be saved until the logo species predominates. The voice. When you look in a mirror, you can see everything but the look itself, i.e. You look at your reflection, but it does not look at you, you cannot look at yourself looking. If you speak into a microphone and you hear your own voice coming back at you, you become confused. You cannot speak to yourself speaking. When schizophrenics hear a voice in their head, they assume it's someone else's voice. After all, how could it be their own? They know what they sound like. Human beings have bicameral, two-chambered, brains. What if there was a time when both hemispheres spoke, when people had two voices? If one voice were deemed the voice of the self then the other voice would have to belong to someone else the other. But what other? If the second voice was more dominant than the first, and it was bound to be because the self would automatically be scared of it, then the second voice would be attributed to a higher power, a god. This is Julian James's bicameral theory. The left hemisphere voice of the self was overshadowed by the right hemisphere voice of the mysterious, numinous other, the god. The self slavishly obeyed the voice of god. This was a natural master-slave system. The voice of God vanished only when the left hemisphere became sufficiently powerful, thanks to a basic amount of logos functioning. However, the right brain voice appeared in a new guise, external mythos communicated via priests, prophets, holy books, and sacred texts, which people then slavishly obeyed. The Jews, Christians, and Muslims all unquestioningly obey their respective mythos belief systems. Their mythos system has replaced the voice of the God, and in fact asserts that it is the word of God. The Quran is literally said to be the perfect word of God. In Logos people, the right brain has almost no power over the left brain. Hence there is no mythos effect. 
The central difference between Logos and Mythos people is that the Logos contingent are overwhelmingly left brain dominant while the Mythos contingent are barely left brain dominant, and their right brain is capable of seizing control, particularly in times of stress. Only Mythos people can be reliably hypnotized. Hypnotism is a means of transferring control from the left brain to the right. The commanding voice of the hypnotist then takes the place of the old right brain voice of God that must be obeyed. The phenomenon of hypnotism is the most effective proof of Jane's theory. Logos and Mythos people are radically dissimilar because their left and right brains have a profoundly different relationship. Logos people execute command and control exclusively from the left brain. In Mythos people, command and control is located in both hemispheres and can easily switch. Logos people have much higher IQs, but Mythos people have higher EQs. Human history is the tale of the bicameral brain and the struggle for dominance between the two hemispheres. Negative hallucinations. In hypnosis, a negative hallucination causes patients to not believe in the existence of a person or object right in front of their eyes. Imagine a room full of furniture. Now imagine hypnotizing someone and telling him that the room is empty of furniture. Command the subject to fetch a painting from the other corner of the room. Now, if the subject really believed the room was empty, he would go straight to the painting. Of course, that would mean he would walk into the furniture between the painting and him. So what happens in practice? In fact, he walks round the furniture as if aware of its presence. However, when asked to account for his weaving route, he makes no reference at all to any furniture and invents all sorts of false statements about his movements. He devises a retrospective rationalization, i.e. the subject is faithful to the hypnotized suggestion that there is no furniture in the room, while subconsciously aware that there is furniture in the room, and comically attempts to accommodate both realities. The question is this. Do human beings routinely invent narratives that bear no resemblance to what they did and why they did it? Are people continually deluding themselves? Are they compulsively lying to themselves? Human beings are designed to create a seamless narrative. If they didn't, they wouldn't perceive themselves as being in control of their own conduct, and they'd go mad. But if they are doing things for unconscious, hence unknown, reasons, then the mind has to invent reasons to ensure a continuous narrative. It's second nature for humans to tell stories to explain things, even though the narratives they construct may have no connection to why they actually did things, exactly as in the case of negative hallucination. The Hidden Observer Stanford psychologist Ernest Hilgard believed that we all share our life with another being that he called the Hidden Observer. In experiments with hypnotized subjects, Hilgard determined that there was an aspect of the self that seemed to remain independent of the hypnotic state and to have a greater level of awareness than normal waking consciousness. This would be the part of us not deceived by negative hallucination. In one experiment, Hilgard hypnotized a blind student, who, while in a trance state, was told that he would become deaf. The student subsequently failed to react to high-volume sounds placed close to his ears. He also failed to respond to any questions he was asked. Hilgard was interested in whether there was anybody else inside the student able to hear, so he said to the student, perhaps there is some part of you that is hearing my voice and processing the information. If there is, I should like the index finger of your right hand to rise as a sign that this is the case. The student's finger duly rose. The student then abruptly requested that he be brought out of his hypnotically induced deafness. Afterwards, the student explained that when he felt his finger lift, without any willed action on his part, he was disconcerted. The implication was that, somebody else, had responded to an external request unheard by the hypnotized student. For Hilgard, this was the, hidden observer. If we go back to bicameralism, we might say that the right hemisphere voice, God, is the, hidden observer, while the left hemisphere man is the follower. In fact, we might say that in the past the follower was permanently under hypnosis by the god, which would account for Abraham's strange behavior when he agreed to murder his son for no reason. The rise of consciousness broke the hypnotic trance. The follower became the active agent taking decisions, and the god fell silent, turning into the hidden observer. 
A modern hypnosis session hypnotizes the bicameral follower, but not the god, who is able to observe everything that happens to the hypnotized subject. The key point is that hypnosis appears to demonstrate the existence of two independent minds. Only one mind is subject to hypnosis. One mind obeys the hypnotic commands and suggestions. The other does not. The second mind functions separately and experiences things of which the hypnotized person appears to be wholly unaware. If you inflict a sharp pain on a person under hypnotic analgesia, he may report no pain and appear unperturbed. However, the hypnotist can then address the hidden self. Typically, the hypnotist will say something like, when I place my hand on your shoulder, I shall be able to talk to a hidden part of you that knows things that are going on in your body, things that are unknown to the part of you to which I am now talking. This may prompt the hidden observer to emerge, at which point the person reports strong pain sensations. Psychologist William James observed this phenomenon in 1899, but it wasn't studied experimentally until 1973, by Hilgard. Isn't it extraordinary that our conscious self can be made oblivious to pain, while the hidden self experiences pain? We might speculate that pain registers in both hemispheres, and even if we suppress it in one, the other will experience it, yet the first hemisphere will have no knowledge of the pain. Our hidden observer could be in constant pain while we know nothing about it. Is this the origin of nightmares? There is an implication that we can simply turn off pain. Congenital analgesia is a rare condition in which a person cannot feel, and has never felt, physical pain. We can perhaps imagine an equivalent scenario when someone constantly feels pain. This would be unbearable, unless the pain could be redirected to somewhere where it was not consciously experienced. Yet the distress caused by the pain would have to emerge somewhere, in our unconscious behavior. One of Hilgard's test subjects regarded the hidden observer as her higher self. She said, the hidden observer is cognizant of everything that is going on. The hidden observer sees more, he questions more, he's aware of what is going on all of the time but getting in touch is totally unnecessary. He's like a guardian angel that guards you from doing anything that will mess you up. The hidden observer is looking through the tunnel and sees everything in the tunnel. Unless someone tells me to get in touch with the hidden observer I'm not in contact. It's just there. The hidden observer can act as a sensor, preventing us from doing anything under hypnosis that we would not normally do, such as murdering someone. It's a kind of Freudian superego. Wikipedia says, this idea of the basic duality of human personality is culturally and historically almost universal. The ancient Chinese called these two independent consciousnesses Hun and Pa, the ancient Egyptians the Ka and the Ba, and the ancient Greeks the Daemon and the Eidolon. In each case, the two entities shared their senses and perceptions of the external world but interpreted those perceptions with regard to their own history, knowledge, and personality. For the Greeks, the relationship was an unequal one. The higher self, the Daemon, acted as a form of guardian angel or higher self over its lower self, the Eidolon. The Stoic philosopher Epictetus wrote, God has placed at every man's side a guardian, the daemon of each man, who is charged to watch over him, a daemon that cannot sleep, nor be deceived. To what greater and more watchful guardian could he have entrusted each of us? So, when you have shut the doors, and made darkness in the house, remember, never to say that you are alone for you are not alone. But God is there, and your daemon is there. It was believed that the daemon could see the future, and give warnings to the idolon. In some sense, it was as if the daemon had already lived the life of its idolon, and was now affording the idolon the chance to escape its fate. Perhaps the daemon has access to a bigger picture of reality than the idolon. Imagine that the Eidolon's thoughts are directed towards the spacetime world of matter where everything is separate, local, while the daemon is attuned to the frequency world of mind where everything is connected, non-local. Alternative thinker Rupert Sheldrake claims that memories can exist outside the physical body in an amorphic field of extended consciousness. Just as a TV detects signals broadcast from far away, the brain can detect mental signals from outside spacetime. 
This would account for psychic experiences, whereby people access information they couldn't possibly know otherwise. A mountaineer reported an experience where both he and his female climbing partner were in serious trouble on a mountain. The woman subsequently died, but the man said that her spirit then guided him to safety. In the zone between life and death, we can break through into other states of consciousness. We can even speak to the dead. We all belong to a spiritual commonwealth, and we are capable of lifting the veil between the living and dead. Some of us have special TVs, so to speak, that allow us to detect channels that others, the overly sensing types, too locked into spacetime, can never see. Scientists refuse to accept mind-slash-soul-slash-spirit as a separate reality from matter. They are incapable of dropping out and tuning in. Idolan Damon Picture by Gustav Dor Image, Feeling, Logic Logos thinkers tend to see the world in terms of logical propositions, binary divisions, and equations. Mythos people tend to perceive the world in terms of resonant images, powerful feelings, and story segments. Heart, gut, and the senses are where they're at. The Logos thinkers, on the other hand, are firmly bound to the rational mind. Logos and Mythos individuals belong to different species. How they understand the world is radically different. They have no empathy and no sympathy with each other. How Adam Came from Eve Freud and Jung believed that the early human embryo is bisexual and later selects one sex or the other. It is now known that all embryos are in fact female, and male sexual characteristics develop from a female template. Although modern biologists are now aware that we were all female at the beginning, it will probably be a long time before the influence of these discoveries filters down to the level where theologians will be ready to consider an Adam out of Eve version of Genesis. June Singer So much for Eve being made from Adam's rib. More like the other way around. The key male sex hormone testosterone plays a vital role in the sexual development of the fetus. Left-handedness, for example, is the result of excess testosterone slowing the growth of the left hemisphere in the developing fetal brain, meaning that the right hemisphere becomes dominant, and the right hemisphere controls the left side of the body. It has been speculated that autistic individuals suffered left brain trauma in the womb due to an abnormal response to testosterone, which then led to right brain dominance. People who have suffered strokes in the left brain have been known to undergo remarkable transformations and discover high-level artistic, musical or mathematical skills that were not in any way previously evident. The left hemisphere is normally considered the seat of language and logic, while the right hemisphere is the province of art, mathematics and music. Autistic savants can show bewildering technical expertise in art, mathematics, and music while often being regarded as backward in language, logic and empathy. The left brain is characterized as selective, focused, and methodical. It filters information to allow the big picture to be seen. The right brain, on the other hand, deals with all of the raw detail that is ignored or heavily filtered by the left brain. Ours is a left brain, big picture, society, but that doesn't mean it was always so. Julian James's radical hypothesis is that what we regard as modern consciousness is intimately connected to the evolving dominance of the left brain, and particularly, to the development of language and writing. Before that, the right brain was in charge and what we regard as consciousness didn't exist. In fact, Jane speculated that human consciousness as we now understand it has existed for only about 3,000 years. In men, the right hemisphere is larger than the left. In women, both hemispheres are of equal size. Gay men have symmetrical brains like those of straight women, and homosexual women have asymmetrical brains like those of heterosexual men, i.e. their right hemispheres are larger than the left, but not quite to the same extent as in heterosexual men. Language circuits are thought to be more symmetrical in straight women than in straight men, hence women's generally superior language skills, and also their greater emotional intelligence, if we make a direct link between emotion and narrative and language skill. The wiring of the emotional brain centers of gay men more closely resembles that of heterosexual women than heterosexual men. Conversely, 
Lesbians have emotional wiring more like heterosexual men. Differences in prenatal concentrations of testosterone are thought to cause these sorts of brain alterations. It's often said that women are better at multitasking than men. This may well be true. Studies have shown that female brains engage both hemispheres in problem-solving tasks, while male brains typically use one hemisphere or the other. Therefore men can't seamlessly switch from one task to another. Depending on the task, they might actually have to switch hemispheric control entirely. Male infants are more interested in objects than in people, female infants are more interested in people than objects. Autism, a predominantly male condition, often involves an obsessive interest in objects and complete disregard for people. Female infants respond more readily to the human voice than do male infants and they seem more interested in faces. In other words, women are more interested in people, hence have a higher emotional intelligence, while men have a higher interest in objects, which can translate into higher IQ, although other factors, aggression in particular, conspire to lower the IQ of many men. In general, males have better spatial and mathematical skills than females. Males typically have a superior ability to visualize a three-dimensional object. Then do females, and this naturally tends to lead to superior abilities in mathematical and geometrical reasoning. Males are also more skilled in motor movements than females, hence their superior skill at many sports. Females generally perform better than males in reading and vocabulary tests. They have superior language skills and are far better in all matters involving emotion and harmony. All diplomats ought to be female or gay. Many scientists are now starting to believe that almost all of our mental activity is unconscious, and consciousness is therefore just a surface phenomenon, the icing on the cake, or the tip of the iceberg. If this is true then it's absurd to think of the world being guided by conscious forces. It's not. It's overwhelmingly driven by unconscious forces. That being the case, humans are actually more like autopilot creatures than conscious agents. They sleepwalk through life, much like animals. It's easy to imagine the bicameral past of humanity when humans weren't conscious at all and responded only to the grunted commands and directions of the alpha males of the group, when the alphas were physically present, and to various auditory and visual hallucinations concerning the alpha males, when the alphas were physically absent. If we want to consciously shape our world and direct our destiny, we have to switch as much processing as possible to our conscious minds. Logos is the primary tool of consciousness while mythos is full of unconscious content. If we want to become gods, we must become a Logos human race and leave behind our mythos inheritance. In Julian James's bicameral theory, the right hemisphere is dominant and the left hemisphere submissive. Consciousness, when it eventually appears, is associated with left brain dominance, mediated by language and logic, and the right hemisphere is submissive. Consciousness thus reverses the relative dominance of the hemispheres. We have associated logos thinking with the left hemisphere and particularly with the rational subjects of philosophy, science, and mathematics, and mythos thinking with the right hemisphere, and the irrational subjects of religion, art and music, and geometrical rather than algebraic mathematics also appears here. However, it's not quite that straightforward. In terms of the Myers-Briggs classification of personality, we can assign the following attributes to the left and right brain hemispheres. Left hemisphere, right hemisphere, thinking, feeling, sensing, intuition, judging, perceiving, extroversion, introversion, dominant, submission, analysis, synthesis. Logos people are found in practice to have a core definition of thinking, intuition, and introversion. Mythos people, on the other hand, have a core definition of feeling, sensing, and extroversion. Therefore, the Logos mind is certainly not exclusively about the left brain. In many Logos people, the mind might reflect a greater right brain than left brain influence. Many aspects of mathematics belong to the province of the right brain but virtually no one other than professional mathematicians gets emotional about mathematics. Mathematics, in many of its facets, is actually a right-brain intuitive phenomenon. In fact, mathematics is the intuitive subject par excellence, because the whole of existence is mathematical. 
Every part of us is unconsciously and intuitively mathematical. It's the feeling part of the human psyche that dislikes mathematics because mathematics seems to have nothing to say to the emotions, although, feelings are mathematical signals. And functions like everything else. Mathematics is syntax and feelings are. Semantics. It would be valid to refer to Logos humans as INT, and Mythos humans as ESF, rather than Logos humans as left hemisphere dominant and Mythos humans as right hemisphere dominant. Or, using the triune brain model, Logos humans are brain 3, neocortex, dominant while Mythos humans are brains 1, brain stem, and 2, limbic system, dominant, i.e. Logos humans are cerebral, and Mythos humans are emotional and instinctual. The core difference, however, is always between reason, logos, and feelings, mythos slash pathos. Mythos people subordinate language to feelings and create emotional narratives. Logos people subordinate language to reason and turn to philosophy, science, and mathematics. Logos is full of numbers. Numbers are almost wholly absent from mythos. Men and women. It's often said that the average woman is more intelligent than the average man, but that geniuses are overwhelmingly male. In other words, the brightest human beings tend to be male, but the most solidly intelligent human beings are female. Many men are astoundingly unintelligent. With women, you get a far more uniform experience. Women tend to have a relatively narrow IQ and EQ distribution. Men have a much wider distribution from apes to geniuses in terms of both IQ and EQ. A small number of men, the roll call of philosophical, scientific, mathematical, artistic and literary geniuses, are almost godlike in their abilities. But they are swamped by legions of knuckle-dragging men who resemble animals. Women are enormously more civilized and human than men, but it's men who have been disastrously in charge of the world. Women provide a relatively narrow range of behaviors because of their hemispheric symmetry, everything is smoothed out. It's as if they have a single brain. Men, with their distinctly asymmetric brains, are the ones with the extreme behavior, the capacity to become gods or beasts, with the beast option being enormously more probable. What humanity needs is the stability that the female brain provides together with its language and emotional fluency, and the genius capabilities of the male brain, while avoiding its psychopathic and bestial aspects. Society is perhaps best suited to being run by women, with genius men acting as advisors. Society definitely shouldn't be run by psychopathic and bestial men as it is at the moment. We have put the worst possible people in charge, and paid the heaviest price. Now that we can understand all of humanity's errors, Surely we can put things right through the exercise of reason. Or will irrational human beings prevent us from rectifying the sins and errors of the past? The Guardian Angel Who is the third who walks always beside you? When I count, there are only you and I together but when I look ahead up the white road there is always another one walking beside you gliding wrapped in a brown mantle, hooded I do not know whether a man or a woman, but who is that on the other side of you? T.S. Eliot the wasteland. I know that during that long and racking march, it seemed to me often that we were four, not three. Ernest Shackleton. Some people, in extreme circumstances, develop the sense of being guided by a benevolent higher power. Is this just wishful thinking, or is there really something there? This phenomenon is known as third man factor, after Eliot's reference. People in states of extreme danger, or near death, have sworn they have received guidance from a sense presence, or heard a spectral voice giving them instructions vital to their survival. Is this a reversion to bicameralism, triggered by extreme stress? Some people are so reassured by the voice they hear that they deliberately place themselves in mortal danger in order to summon it again. A man became lost in a snow-covered canyon. A blue light then appeared in front of him, so he said, which he then followed for several miles to safety. Charles Lindbergh, in the 22nd hour of his pioneering transatlantic flight, when he was desperately fighting to stay awake, found himself in the presence of spectral forms encouraging him and offering him guidance on navigation. They stayed with him until he reached land. Later, 
He wrote of this experience, the fuselage behind me becomes filled with ghostly presences, vaguely outlined forms, transparent, moving, riding weightless with me in the plane. I feel no surprise at their coming. There's no suddenness to their appearance. Without turning my head, I can see them as clearly as though in my normal vision. These visions were emanations from the experience of ages, inhabitants of a universe close to mortal men. Extreme tiredness caused by sleep deprivation can bring dreams into waking consciousness. Was Lindbergh simply experiencing a waking dream? Are schizophrenics those who enter a state of continuous waking dreaming, where they can't distinguish reality from the dream state? In his studies of the brain, Canadian neuroscientist Michael Persinger places a modified football helmet, the God helmet, over a subject's head, and electrodes then stimulate the temporal lobes of the subject's brain. When both the right and left hemispheres are stimulated, Persinger reports that many subjects claim to sense a powerful presence. Persinger infers that the dominant left hemisphere is interpreting the extra activity in the normally damped down right hemisphere as a second self, or divine manifestation. Knowledge Do hallucinated voices tell you things you don't know? How are they able to do that? Do the voices have godlike knowledge that we could tap? As many as 10% of people claim to hear voices at some time in their life, most of which are not deemed psychotic episodes. Many children have vivid, imaginary friends. Why? The real person. Human beings consist of two people, the unconscious person who is mostly what a person actually is, and the conscious person who tries to make sense of it all in a coherent narrative, and is what a person believes he is. Just as the persona is the mask that consciousness dons, so consciousness is the persona that the unconscious dons. The persona is our conscious mask and our consciousness is the mask of our unconscious. Just as the persona is a lie, or our personal spin doctor, so is consciousness the unconscious's lie, spin doctor. Consciousness is how we put a spin on all the things that our unconscious mind has decided to do. Consciousness is designed for inventing stories, excuses, rationalizations, and alibis for the real person in our life, the unconscious. Consciousness has been likened to the dummy steering wheel that baby Maggie uses in the opening credits of The Simpsons while her mom is doing. The Rayal Driving Consciousness is of course no mere epiphenomenon, but it's much less in control than we all like to imagine. The more self-conscious you are then the more you can wrest control from the unconscious. Reason is the antidote to unconscious control. Feelings are not only not the antidote, they are the unconscious control. Emotions are entirely caused by the unconscious mind. Therefore, mythos people are unconscious people laying a conscious narrative over their unconscious conduct. Only logos people are genuinely conscious. The waking world and the dream world. No one believes that they created the external world. We inhabit the external world and do things in it. Now consider the world of our dreams. During sleep, we inhabit this dream world, and do things in it. But who created this dream world? If we created our dreams ourselves, they would make perfect sense to us, so the fact that they are so mysterious and enigmatic means we cannot be their authors. Therefore, something else creates our dream worlds. A novelist is conscious of making the fictional world he writes about, but he has no consciousness of making his dream worlds. Accordingly, they must have a different author. Just as a novelist manipulates his characters, the author of our dreams seems able to manipulate us and place us in all sorts of situations, good and bad, happy and sad, delightful and horrific, thrilling and terrifying. During a dream, you are a character in a story and world invented by someone who is not you. You are an author's puppet. Don't you find that disturbing? If this is going on during your dreams, how do you know something similar isn't going on while you're awake? How do you know you're really in charge? Now imagine that thousands of years ago, this mysterious author who can control you actually spoke to you, i.e. you could literally hear his voice, telling you what to do. He would be your god, would he not? You would obey him without question. You would have an unbreakable religious sensibility, and be certain of enjoying life after death, where you would join your god. Naturally, 
people were highly religious when their unconscious spoke directly to them when they were subject to the will of their own dream. Maker Humans were obedient and submissive in those times. When did they start becoming disobedient? There are two domains, one for the mind, an immaterial frequency domain outside space and time, and one for the body, a space-time domain of matter. The primary mind is the one that points at the mental domain. This was the mind that ruled in ancient times. The mind that pointed at space-time was primitive and secondary. It was much more sensory, and much less intuitive. As humanity evolved, its relationship with the space-time domain became stronger and stronger, and its relationship with the frequency domain weaker and weaker. Eventually, dominance switched from the frequency mind to the space-time mind, and the frequency mind fell silent, becoming the unconscious. That's where we are today. 3D versus 2D I think 2D is going to be like black and white soon because 3D is the natural way that people encounter life, so it's a revolution the way that Greco-Roman sculpture was after hieroglyphics. Sigourney Weaver The point of cinema is not to replicate real life, how tedious that would be. But to create the perfect mythos space, i.e. the ideal inner space, story. Space hyperspace, where we are taken out of our humdrum daily lives and immersed in a perfect story that elevates us, inspires us, motivates us, renews our energy and sends us out into the real world on our quest for our own holy grail. It is by no means apparent that 3D enhances the mythos world, except in rare and particular circumstances where the medium matches the message. In fact, 3D can easily get in the way. Having to wear 3D spectacles is an imposition, a distraction. We are aware of being watchers in an artificial environment. Our ability to suspend our disbelief is undermined. And, let's face it, most 3D movies, like most 2D movies, are dreadful. It's a mistake to imagine that more and perfect reproduction of reality leads to a better and better movie experience. We're not there, in the cinema, for reality. We're there for fantasy, for mythos. Narcolepsy Sleep transfers dominance from the space-time mind, consciousness, to the frequency mind, the unconscious. The conscious mind becomes passive. It enters the world of the other mind, and has no control over what happens, except if it is highly trained to engage in lucid dreaming. People believe that the brain is taking a rest when it sleeps, but measurements show that at certain periods during sleep, the brain is more active than during waking. People suffering from the condition of narcolepsy fall asleep many times a day, often at the most inconvenient and embarrassing moments. Some victims are prey to paralyzing attacks. They fall to the ground and are unable to move. They suffer a total loss of muscle control, causing complete paralysis. They can see and hear everything, but can't move a muscle. These are called cataplectic attacks. Bizarrely, these attacks are often brought on by shows of strong emotion, so some victims strive to avoid laughing and crying, being angry, happy or sad. Sleep for these people is restless and often punctuated with vivid nightmares. One victim reported that he could hear his surroundings while seeing terrifying hallucinations. He said he was awake yet still dreaming. The neurotransmitter orexin is vital in keeping you awake keeping you alert. A neurotransmitter is a chemical signal that a cell releases to communicate with another cell. There are many neurotransmitters. They are the signals the brain sends out to switch on and off all of our various functions. Different neurotransmitters enable the brain to control speech, movement, and even emotions. Orexin is a neurotransmitter found only in the hypothalamus. It has been found that narcoleptics have just one-tenth of the cells that produce orexin compared with normal people. At night, our body clock stops our hypothalamus producing orexin, and thus we go to sleep. In the morning, orexin production starts up again, and we awake. If we had a constant supply of orexin, we might never go to sleep. With no orexin, we would be asleep all the time. With insufficient amounts of the vital neurochemical, narcolepsy is the result. Sleep isn't about rest if the brain can often actually use more energy than when awake. 
But, of course, it's not the brain that is going to sleep. In fact, nothing is sleeping. What is happening is that primary mental processing is being switched from the space-time mind to the frequency mind. Both minds are active at all times. Sleep means that the space-time mind is no longer engaged with the external world of space-time. Instead, it is now interacting with the internal mental world created by the frequency mind. When the space-time mind was much less powerful than it is today, the frequency mind had a much more prominent role, in the manner envisaged by Julian Jaynes. Our space-time mind in the waking state could, back then, easily have been as passive and obedient as it is when we are dreaming. Without orexin, people cannot control their sleep. When orexin floods into our brains, it wakes us up. But what happened before orexin arrived on the scene? All life must have been asleep, like plants. Dr. Jerry Siegel said, orexin controls a broad spectrum of wake-promoting systems in the brain. It has direct connections to many different systems and it excites them very strongly and at the appropriate time orexin is released in higher amounts and this causes arousal. Orexin is able to activate all your arousal systems, so it's an important component of keeping you awake, keeping you alert and preventing you from having any lapses in attention. It's orexin that keeps you awake. Without it, you would never wake in the first place. Production slows down at night, and speeds up in the morning. We can think of orexin in other terms, as the chemical that wakes our space-time mind. Without it, our body would be asleep, and our frequency mind would be in total control. In death, there is no orexin. Saving the world? If an alien species threatened to exterminate humanity unless we could prove our worth to the universe, we would present them with all of our greatest logos achievements, and our highest art. But the aliens would nevertheless immediately wipe us out, for being such shameless liars. Humanity is not truly represented by its logos achievements and high art. Almost all of humanity is represented by junk culture, hatred of high art, hatred of all logos achievements, celebration of insane and intolerant mythos, holy, texts, crass emotionalism, and general lowest common denominator dumbed-down behavior of instant gratification and relentless pursuit of the pleasure principle. Consciousness and the Analog Eye Subjective conscious mind is an analog of what we call the real world. It is built up with a vocabulary or lexical field whose terms are all metaphors or analogs of behavior in the physical world. It allows us to shortcut behavioral processes and arrive at more adequate decisions. And it is intimately bound with volition and decision. In that space we can approach a problem, perhaps from some viewpoint, grapple with its difficulties. Every word we use to refer to mental events is a metaphor or analog of something in the behavioral world. The space of consciousness, which I shall hereafter call mind space, is a functional space that has no location except as we assign one to it. This mind space I regard as the primary feature of consciousness. Julian Jaynes if mind space is not there, there is no consciousness. If mind space is restricted, consciousness is restricted. Language builds the mind space. Without language, there is no mind space, hence no consciousness. Animals have no language, hence no mind space and no consciousness. Autistics have restricted language, hence restricted mind space and restricted consciousness. In scientific materialist terms, how do atoms produce languages? How do they produce a mind space? How do they produce consciousness? Science has no answers. Who does the seeing? Who does the introspecting? Here we introduce analogy, which differs from metaphor in that the similarity is between relationships rather than between things or actions. As the body with its sense organs, referred to as I, is to physical seeing, so there develops automatically an analog, I, to relate to this mental kind of seeing in mind space. The analog, I, is the second most important feature of consciousness. As the bodily, I, can move about in its environment looking at this or that, so the analog, I, learns to move about in mind space concentrating on one thing or another. If you saw yourself swimming in our earlier example, it was your analog, I, that was doing the seeing. 
Julian Jaynes. A baby is not born with an eye. It has to construct it. It does so with the help of its parents, siblings, and others. The eye is constructed in a social context. A child on a desert island would never construct an eye, hence never be conscious. The development of the eye is a lifelong task. With the right education system, we can produce the super eye, the eye fit for gods. A third feature of consciousness is narratization, the analogic simulation of actual behavior. It is an obvious aspect of consciousness, which seems to have escaped previous synchronic discussions of consciousness. Consciousness is constantly fitting things into a story, putting a before and an after around any event. This feature is an analog of our physical selves moving about through a physical world with its spatial successiveness, which becomes the successiveness of time in mind space. And this results in the conscious conception of time which is a spatialized time in which we locate events and indeed our lives. It is impossible to be conscious of time in any other way than as a space. Julian Jaynes Autistics have profound difficulties with language, communication, empathy and theory of mind, the notion that other people have their own minds, with their own thoughts. It's fascinating to apply Jaynes's mind-space scheme to autistics. They seem to suffer from an enormously shrunken, or non-existent, mind space. The Salian test is one way of diagnosing autism. A child is told that a girl called Sally put a marble in a basket, then left the room. While she was gone, another girl called and removed the marble from the basket and put it in a box, at which point Sally returned to the room, not having seen the switch. The child is asked, where will Sally look for her marble? Normal children know that Sally will expect to find it where she left it, so they say the basket. Autistic children say, in the box, because that's where the marble literally is. They are unable to appreciate that Sally did not know that the marble had been moved. They could not put themselves in her shoes and see the world from her perspective. Autistics do not seem to have a mind space where they can carry out these exercises. They are locked into the literal world of physical space. In the Sally Ann test, we see that the autistic is fixated on where the object actually is in physical space, and is unable to conceive that in the mind space of Sally, the object is where she last left it, not where it is now. They are unable to deal with the two spaces, physical and mental, which have no necessary connection. We can easily imagine activities in our mind space, such as flying, that cannot happen in physical space. Objects can be located in one place in someone's mental space but somewhere else entirely in physical space. We can create objects, such as unicorns and elves, in mind. Space that can never exist in physical space. Mind space can reflect physical. Space, but can also be radically different. For autistics, mind space is treated as exactly the same as physical space, so whatever is true of physical reality must be true of mental reality too. Therefore, if the object Sally wants is located in the box, Sally must know this, so the autistic reasons. But, of course, Sally does not know this. Can you imagine how weird the world must be for autistics when they try to communicate with normal people? Because autistics have no comprehension of mind space, and how radically different it can be from physical space, they are permanently baffled when people do not know things that, in the autistic's opinion, they ought to know. They can't comprehend normal people referring to unobservable things in mind space. It's as if all normal people are conspiring against them, and speaking some weird, alien, cryptic language, all talking in an unbreakable code. Autistics thus become more and more withdrawn and difficult. They like routine and can't stand things changing. They hate meeting strangers. They have extremely little imagination and intuition. They can't narratize effectively, because that requires a mind space and adequate language skills. They can't make plans for the future, because that requires a mind space, and is all about change, whereas autistics don't want anything to change. This all means that autistics are examples of human beings with radically different consciousness from normal people. They are not in the same state of consciousness as normal people hence cannot communicate effectively with normal people. 
scientists, like autistics, struggle with mind space. They accept only what they can physically observe, and rubbish everything else. Normal people inhabit two spaces, physical space and mind space. Autistics inhabit only physical space. But this raises the possibility of a different group of people who overwhelmingly inhabit the mind space, and have poor contact with physical space. Conditions such as schizophrenia and multiple personality disorder, dissociative identity disorder, are produced in people with too strong a mind space, meaning that they live in a fantasy world most of the time. Many drugs expand the mind space and lessen a person's interaction with physical space. Drug use in people who have a propensity for mental illness can easily push them over the edge. On the other hand, one way of helping autistics might be to treat them with LSD, cannabis, magic mushrooms, and so on, in order to expand their mind space. However, in autistics, the law of unintended consequences might apply, and the opposite effect might be achieved, i.e. it could perhaps have the disastrous consequence of further shrinking their mind space and actually amplifying their physical space and physical sensations. Handle with care. What differentiates humans from animals? Mind space. Only we have a significant mind space. What were the first humans like? They were almost certainly robotic autistics, very attuned to the physical world, for avoiding predators, and identifying prey. They had no mental interior. They did not plan for the future. They very much lived in the moment. Eventually, evolution produced non-autistic humans with a vast mind space. This change gave rise to bicameral humans, people, rather like schizophrenics, who regularly experienced mental and auditory hallucinations which they took to be real, connecting them to a higher, divine order, i.e. they believed they were in contact with another reality, that of gods immortal, immaterial individuals that transcended physicality. As time went by, evolution arrived at a different, more equitable balance of physical and mind space, sufficient to produce what we now regard as normal consciousness. However, even normal consciousness has a vast range. Highly emotional and intuitive individuals are close to bicameralism. Highly sensory people, such as scientists, are close to autism. They have a desperate struggle to conceive of the reality of mind, and they ridicule the idea of an eternal soul. They deny free will and present humans as physical machines or soulless zombies. It's essential to understand that the human mentality has not always been like it is now. It has undergone the most staggering alterations. Humans began as nothing more than elaborate apes, with virtually no language skills, and a minimal mind space. They were all autistic. Autism is simply a reversion to a previous state of humanity, a return to a far more brainstem reality with little input from the limbic system and neocortex. Look at the life of a crocodile, with its basic, inflexible routines. Every day is essentially the same. So it is with autistics. They are human crocodiles, without the violence. Psychopaths are autistics with the violence. Evolution then lurched the other way presumably accompanied by a radical increase in the power of the limbic system, and also the neocortex. The human mind space expanded dramatically, while the physical space shrank equally dramatically. In the mind space, emotion ruled. Here, thanks to the extra power supplied by the neocortex, empathy and sympathy developed, as well as theory of mind, and mythos. This allowed us to break free of our autistic, brain-stem past. Autistics perceive the world in much more sensory detail than normal people. They suffer from sensory overload, an emotional and intuitive underload. The new type of human, ruled by the limbic system helped by the neocortex, transferred a vast amount of brain processing from the senses to the emotions and intuition. Initially, the process went too far, and humans became bicameral. They were under the control of their mind space, and somewhat alienated from physical space. That's why religion, dealing with unphysical things, took off. Autistic humans essentially died out, although their genes still remained in the gene pool, capable of resurfacing in the population at any time. Neanderthals were probably autistics who failed to generate an expanded mind space. 
Imagine a war between Neanderthals and bicamerals. Who would win? In the present day, imagine if the world comprised solely autistics and schizophrenics. Who would win? If brain stem humans were autistic, limbic system humans were schizophrenic, governed by her voices. The genes for bicameralism remain in the gene pool, just as those for autism do. Brain stem humans weren't religious at all, just as animals aren't. Limbic system humans were, on the other hand, obsessed with religion. Then came the third radical change, the rise and increasing dominance of the neocortex, no longer the mere servant of the limbic system, and the birth of reason, logic, math, science and philosophy. Ancient Greece was ground zero for new humanity. However, the Greeks were overly theoretical and lost out to the Romans, who adopted Greek culture, but with a far more practical bias. The Roman Empire spread the new neocortex mentality around the world. By now, the bicameral voices could no longer be heard, but the gods were not forgotten. It wasn't until the Enlightenment that some people felt they could do without gods entirely. Science became the new god, but this was something of a return to the old autistic mentality. Again, physical space became dominant while mind space was regarded as absurd. Mind space went missing for many years, then was brought back as the unconscious and studied by psychologists. When the Spaniards encountered the Aztecs and Incas in the 16th century, they were effectively neocortex humans versus bicameral humans. All of human history has been a clash of different mentalities, whether autistic, bicameral or modern consciousness. Today, we have scientific atheism, a reflection of autism, versus religious fundamentalism, a reflection of bicameralism. Muslims seem extraordinarily bicameral. Their whole culture, predicated on the worship of the Word of God, the Quran, conveyed directly to Muhammad, the Prophet of God, is based on bicameralism, on slavishly obeying the Book and the Prophet. Muslims choose not to be free people making their own decisions. They want to be ruled by an ancient book. The same is true of Jews, Christians, Sikhs, Hindus, Buddhists and Taoists. Humans find it so hard to understand each other because they are literally indifferent, incompatible mind states. At the moment, humanity is still largely bicameral, with a thin layer of advanced neocortex superimposed over this older type of mental state. Autism has had a resurgence, and is supported by the scientific mentality, it's noteworthy that many scientists have autistic children. What we need is much more neocortex power, sufficient to allow us to break away decisively from both bicameralism and autism. Humanity will then become much more rational and logical, and far more conscious. Scientific materialism and empiricism, which is atheistic, will be replaced by scientific idealism and rationalism, which supports rational spirituality. Religion and philosophy. Human physical evolution is essentially over. Mental evolution emphatically isn't. A human body inhabits a physical space. The human mind has one component directed towards space-time, the physical space, and another component directed towards the frequency domain, mind-space. The human mentality is based on the precise balance between these two components. Go too far into physical space and you are autistic. Go too far into mind space and you are schizophrenic. Bicameral humans were more or less schizophrenic, and today's humans are still largely bicameral if you scratch beneath the surface. According to Julian James, hypnosis is a means for resurrecting the old bicameral mind, whereby people slavishly obey a dominant voice, in this case that of the hypnotist. Religion does much the same. Muslims are effectively hypnotized by the Quran and their prophet. They can't imagine disobeying. They have surrendered their free will. Strangely enough, scientists have also relinquished their free will. In fact, they deny that anyone has free will. They claim that we are subject to the forces of nature, the laws that apply to atoms, and we have no means to override these. In other words, they deny the existence of a non-atomic soul or mind that has its own causal agency separate from that of atoms. 
Alan Turing and the Imitation Game Are there imaginable digital computers which would do well in the imitation game? Alan Turing Alan Turing, widely considered the father of theoretical computer science and artificial intelligence, was a classic example of a weird, high-functioning autistic. In fact, all of his thinking on computers flowed from his autism. The movie The Imitation Game is about his troubled life, where he found being human rather too much for him. In a scene set at Sherborne Private School, his only school friend Christopher Morecambe describes cryptography to him as concerning messages that anyone can see, but no one knows what they mean, unless you have the key. Turing asks, how is that different from talking? When people talk to each other, they never say what they mean. They say something else. And you're supposed to just know what they mean. Only, I never do. How's cryptography different? This is a classic statement by an autistic. Normal humans communicate via a mind space that they all understand. Autistics do not have any access to this neurotypical mind space, or any understanding of it. They do not grasp subtext, custom and practice, metaphor, or things that are so obvious to normals that they never need to be spelled out. Autistics only understand literalism, everything being painfully stated in every detail just as computer instructions must be. Autistics have computer minds, so what Alan Turing did was nothing special. For someone like him, computer science is facile. It's simply a reflection of his own thought processes. Other people struggle with computing because they don't think like computers. They aren't programmed. Unlike computers, they have access to a mental space. A computer, like an autistic, has zero comprehension of a mental space. Such a thing doesn't exist for a computer. No computer could ever imitate a human being because no computer could ever have access to a mental space. However, a computer could certainly imitate an autistic and vice versa. Nearly all serious proponents of AI and transhumanism are autistics. They feel an overwhelming affinity for machines. That's because these people are not, and never have been, truly human. Autistics are like an interspecies. They are computer-human hybrids. The vast majority of programmers and hackers are autistic. Alan Turing invented the famous Turing test. Wikipedia describes the test in the following terms. The Turing test is a test, developed by Alan Turing in 1950, of a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior equivalent to or indistinguishable from, that of a human. Turing proposed that a human evaluator would judge natural language conversations between a human and a machine that is designed to generate human-like responses. The evaluator would be aware that one of the two partners in conversation is a machine, and all participants would be separated from one another. The conversation would be limited to a text-only channel such as a computer keyboard and screen so that the result would not be dependent on the machine's ability to render words as speech. If the evaluator cannot reliably tell the machine from the human, Turing originally suggested that the machine would convince a human 70% of the time after five minutes of conversation, the machine is said to have passed the test. The test does not check the ability to give correct answers to questions, only how closely answers resemble those a human would give. The test was introduced by Turing in his paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, while working at the University of Manchester. It opens with the words, I propose to consider the question, can machines think? Because thinking is difficult to define, Turing chooses to replace the question by another, which is closely related to it and is expressed in relatively unambiguous words. Turing's new question is, are there imaginable digital computers which would do well in the imitation game? This question, Turing believed, is one that can actually be answered. In the remainder of the paper, he argued against all the major objections to the proposition that machines can think. Since Turing first introduced his test, it has proven to be both highly influential and widely criticized, and it has become an important concept in the philosophy of artificial intelligence. The Turing test is absurd. No AI could ever fool a genuine human being. It has no mental space. 
The only people who would ever believe that an aide that I had passed the Turing test would be autistics. In fact, it is well known that many autistics cannot pass the Turing test. No normal human being could ever have a normal conversation with an autistic. The movie The Imitation Game shows on numerous occasions how Turing cannot communicate with human beings, and feels much more at home with. Machines Autistics do not have human brains. They have machine brains. Autistics are not conscious in any genuine human sense. Most internet trolls are autistics. They simply don't grasp the conventions of the human race. Alan Turing often came to work wearing pajamas under his coat and cycled to his office in a gas mask to counteract his hay fever. He buried some gold ingots then forgot where he put them. They still haven't been found. When he was interviewed by police regarding his relationship with another man, he immediately told them that they had met for gay sex, a criminal offense in the UK at the time, for which we was promptly arrested. Because they have little or no mind space, autistics find it almost impossible to lie. Turing named his code-breaking machine, Christopher, after his beloved school friend, with whom he was undoubtedly in love. That was the most human thing he ever did. Turing proved that his universal computing machine would be capable of performing any conceivable mathematical computation if it were representable as an algorithm. Wikipedia Humans are not universal computing machines. Humans can think without using algorithms. Autistics can't. Autistics are as baffled by normal human beings as an algorithmic machine would be. It's supremely ironic that Turing should have conceived of the imitation game whereby machines can supposedly imitate humans, but not so as to convince any actual human. After all, as an autistic, Turing himself was a human imitator. Autistics are not human. They are biological humans, but they are not mentally human, and the mind, not the body, is what is most characteristic about humans. Autistics have machine minds. They might be considered as people who have had their limbic system, imagination and intuition surgically removed. They are nothing but a brain stem connected to a neocortex. There's a great deal of speculation about why Turing killed himself. Normally, his homosexuality is implicated. In fact, he probably realized the futility of trying to imitate a human when you are not human. The angel experiment is about converting humans into angels, i.e. beings with an even bigger mental space. The Turing experiment is about converting humans into machines, entities with no mental space at all. Modern science despises the mind, the mind space and the concept of free will. Science has bought Turing's agenda hook, line and sinker. Science is inhuman, anti-human, and the enemy of humanity. It supports a machine society full of machine people. We must overcome science. We must overcome Turing and his ilk. The autistics will never rule our world. Equals 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 equals. It is the very people who no one else imagines anything of who do the things that no one else can imagine. Alan Turing, The Imitation Game. For sure, no one would expect an autistic to do anything a human could not imagine, except in the field of computing in A.I. where imagination is redundant, and algorithmic thinking rules all. Humans can't imagine the machine world. Autistics can. They're already part of it. Thanks to Turing, the second half of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century have seen an enormous amount of power and influence being transferred away from humans and towards autistics, human machines. Globalization is an autistic project. Most of the leaders of the technology movement that is disastrously redefining our world are autistic. Their rise is a catastrophe for genuine human beings. When is humanity going to wake up to the danger? We are sleepwalking into the Terminator world. The autistics will one day start planning the extermination of normals. Turing, to borrow a phrase from Shakespeare, was hell's black. Intelligencer. Turing wasn't a hero. He was a monster, and his work threatens us all. The quality of human life is being destroyed by technology that is converting humans into machines right in front of our eyes. 
humans have stopped physically interacting. All they do now is stare into screens all day long, and carry around smartphones as if they were the most precious objects on earth. Where is their humanity? We must resist the machine world and embrace the angel world. We must expand the mind space until we are gods. We shall never do so via machines, which have no mental space at all. The bizarre interpretations of reality produced by scientists are those conceived by autistic minds. They have no connection to true reality. The real world is mental, not physical i.e. the exact opposite of what scientists claim. This is not a materialist universe, it's an idealist universe. Everything begins and ends with mind, not matter. However, autistics will never grasp this. That's their tragedy. Science, like computing, is a primary bastion of autism. We cannot continue to allow autistics to misinterpret reality as if it were a dead machine rather than a living organism. Nietzsche wrote, the snake which cannot cast its skin has to die. As well, the minds which are prevented from changing their opinions, they cease to be mind. Machines can't change their minds. That's why they're machines. Autistics can't change their minds either. The overthrow of religion by science was simply the overthrow of bicamerals by autistics. Is that an improvement? We need a new world, ruled by the autonomous, by the angels. The Autism Wars The Autism Wars are coming. Humanity will have to decide if it wants to follow the transhumanist, machine agenda of scientific materialism, computer science, and AI, or the mind-expanding pursuit of our angelic and divine heritage. We are not humans masquerading as machines. We are angels in the guise of humans. Autistics are those without any angelic component. The gods have abandoned these people. That's why autistics love machines so much. Autism campaigner Suzanne Wright stated that families dealing with the condition are not living, they are existing. Autistics destroy families. They wreck lives. Autism is on the rise everywhere. Gadgets designed by and for autistics are changing the nature of humanity. Humans are merging with their technology. Machines can't become angels and gods. Put away your gadgets and toys. Find your spiritual wings. It's not a deficiency of matter you suffer from, it's a deficiency of mind. Your mind is infinite. Only mind is divine. The Language Game Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, in his book The Great Partnership, God, Science and the Search for Meaning, made a number of fascinating suggestions. He observed that all languages that do not include symbols for vowels in their alphabets, Hebrew, for example, take a right-to-left path across the page, while languages written in an alphabet that does include symbols for vowels, Greek, for example, go in the opposite way, from left to right. Sachs suggests that there are right-brained languages, Arabic, Hebrew, and all Semitic languages, which are written without vowels, and left-brained ones, Greek and all other European languages, which have vowels. As for Chinese, characters are written from top to bottom and from left to right. Although language abilities are normally located in the left hemisphere, it seems fair enough to conjecture that left-to-right languages activate the cortical hemispheres in a different way from right-to-left languages, just as. Sachs suggests. Imagine if every human being were brought up with two languages, a left-to-right and right-to-left language. Would that bring about better hemispheric balance? It's said that the grammar, syntax and vocabulary of any language are the province of the left hemisphere, while intonation and figurative meanings are the province of the right. Sachs maintains that Hebrew is a right-brained language, because to understand the meaning of the word you have to understand the total context in which it occurs. Greek, he says, was the first language to be written left to right, which activates the left brain which allows you to understand word by word what each word means. It's fascinating that almost exactly the same moment as this left brain alphabet appears, 5th, 6th century before the Christian era, so does the left brain thinking, namely the philosophy and the science of the pre-Socratics, and you get Greek developing this very analytical atomistic way of thinking which is very similar to Richards, Dawkins, culminating in Epicurus who believes in only 
material realities and testable entities. The trouble is, that didn't last very long, whereas the Jewish people and the Hebrew religious values which it gave rise to have lasted now for 4,000 years. Sachs goes on to say, and what made Europe happen, and made it so creative is that Christianity was a right-brained religion, its founder was a Jew living in Israel, translated into a left-brained language, because all the early Christian texts are in Greek. So for many centuries you had this view that science and religion are essentially part of the same thing, the same way of thinking. The most ancient languages are bicameral languages, reflecting right hemispheric dominance. More recent languages are conscious languages, reflecting left hemispheric dominance. Human was bicameral while it used right to left languages. When it adopted left to right languages, it became conscious. Left to right languages silence the gods. Right to left languages reawaken the gods. Science is a subject heavily geared towards physical space and atheism. Mathematics, on the other hand, can easily ignore physical space and be conducted in mind space, where it can support religious and spiritual ideas. The first enlightenment was scientific, about physical space. The second and final enlightenment will be about mathematics, involving mind. Space. Mind space. Are the characters in the Iliad narratizing with an analog, I, in a mind space and making decisions in this way? If you take the generally accepted oldest parts of the Iliad and ask, is there evidence of consciousness? The answer, I think, is no. People are not sitting down and making decisions. No one is. No one is introspecting. No one is even reminiscing. It is a very different kind of world. Then, who makes the decisions? Whenever a significant choice is to be made, a voice comes in telling people what to do. These voices are always and immediately obeyed. These voices are called gods. To me this is the origin of gods. I regard them as auditory hallucinations similar to, although not precisely the same as, the voices heard by Joan of Arc or William Blake. Or similar to the voices that modern schizophrenics hear similar perhaps to the voices that some of you may have heard. While it is regarded as a very significant symptom in the diagnosis of schizophrenia, auditory. Hallucinations also occur in some form at some time in about half the general population, Posey and Losh, 1983. I have also corresponded with or interviewed people who are completely normal in function but who suddenly have a period of hearing extensive verbal hallucinations, usually of a religious sort. Julian Jaynes You are a person that inhabits the physical space. Your I exists in the mind space. In the mind space, you make your plans, you consider your options, you think of other people, who are not physically present, you have dreams, hopes, fears, and so on. None of these things is happening in the physical world. Only when you have made your decision, in mind space, about what action you are going to take, does your action get translated into the physical world, thus banishing all of the other mind space options that you chose not to carry out. Autistics, lacking mind space, spend far less time pondering what to do than normals. Animals don't spend any time choosing what to do. They simply do. Verbal hallucinations are common today, but in early civilization I suggest that they were universal. This mentality in early times, as in the Iliad, is what is called the bicameral mind on the metaphor of a bicameral legislature. A metaphor is composed of a metaphrand, the thing to be described, and a metaphor, a familiar thing you can use to describe the metaphrand, dot. It simply means that human mentality at this time was in two parts, a decision-making part and a follower part, and neither part was conscious in the sense in which I have described consciousness. Human beings can speak and understand, learn, solve problems, and do much that we do but without being conscious. So could bicameral man. In his everyday life he was a creature of habit, but when some problem arose that needed a new decision or a more complicated solution than habit could provide, that decision stress was sufficient to instigate an auditory hallucination. Because such individuals had no mind space in which to question or rebel, such voices had to be obeyed. Julian Jaynes
Your I is a mental construct operating in a mental space. This is what carries your consciousness. An animal doesn't have a mentally constructed I, so isn't conscious. An autistic person has a radically restricted, so has very different consciousness from a normal human being. Above all, autistics are not able to place representations of the I of other people in their mind space and reflect on these other is in order to solve problems such as the Salian test. The reason they can't do this is that they are dealing with a vastly expanded physical space in comparison with normal people, i.e. they see enormously more physical detail than normal people, and this has the effect of nullifying their mental space. There just isn't enough brain processing power for handling a large physical space and a large mind space. The latter is shrunk to make way for the former. In normal people, the former is reduced to allow for an expanded mind space. Normal people stare at faces much more than autistic people do. So that they can better simulate the I of the other person in their mind space. They are alert to every gesture and what it might signify. An autistic doesn't care. He's no more interested in a face than a table or chair, it's just another object in the physical world. It's not a portal to mind space as it is for a normal person. Shakespeare said, the eyes are the window of the soul. Those who do not gaze into eyes are soulless, and have no interest in souls. This is one of the reasons why autistics are so poor at communication and have such difficulties in social situations. When you are asked to remember the details of your life, it's not your physical self that's doing the remembering, it's your constructed, I, in mind space. It remembers what it did in the past, and it contemplates what it will do in the future. It builds a continuous narrative around itself. In terms of Jungian personality types, sensing types are on the autistic spectrum, while intuitives are on the schizophrenic spectrum. Thinking types are on the autistic spectrum if they ally their thinking to sensing, as scientists do, and are on the schizophrenic spectrum if they ally their thinking to intuition, as many philosophers and mathematicians do. The same is true for feeling types. A feelings person who allies his feelings to his senses is very different from a feelings person who allies his feelings to intuitions. The former are nature lovers who thrive on interacting with the physical world, the latter are poets and mystics who love contemplating interior worlds. With the analog eye, we are looking out at the world from the mental construct that carries our consciousness. When we are considering the analog eye as something we are looking at, Julian James calls it, metaphor me, i.e. We are using our analog eye to look at itself, in which case it becomes an object of contemplation. Your actual self, the self that the analog eye is an analog of, is just a kind of zombie, waiting to be told what to do by the analog eye. In bicameral times, the thing that did the telling was that God, in the right hemisphere. This was either an analog God or an actual God, or angel or higher self. Consciousness goes hand in hand with narratization, with a continuous story centered on you. Our most vivid memories relate to the best and worst parts of our story. The trouble is that people can tell themselves a story about their life that is totally false. They may assign wholly deluded motives to why they acted as they did. They may bury all sorts of nasty, low, petty reasons that were genuinely motivating their behavior, but which they don't want to acknowledge. Not only do we narratize our own life, we do the same for everyone else too, and even for nations, religions, political systems, and so on. Politicians are always trying to construct a narrative. We can even narratize the lives of animals and cartoon characters. We can imagine the continued narrative of a character we encountered in a book, even though he's just a fiction. Humans have things explained to them overwhelmingly via narrative means, which engages their emotions, imagination, and intuition. They dislike abstract explanations involving technical jargon. Above all, the average person hates explanations delivered via equations and numbers, i.e. via logos rather than mythos. Mathematics is the supreme logos language, the language of perfection, the language of God and the angels. The task is preserve mythos but subordinated to logos. Humans prefer to worship mythos and discard logos entirely. Prodigious savants 
Some individuals with a mental disability such as autism can demonstrate profound abilities far beyond what is considered normal. They have savant syndrome. Since they often score very low on IQ tests, they are sometimes called idiot savants. They have exceptional skills in areas such as rapid calculation, memory, art, calendar calculation, or musical ability. Some savants can access the type of low-level information that is present in all human brains, but is normally inaccessible to conscious awareness. One prodigious savant can read 500 pages in an hour. Another can play back any piece of music after hearing it just once. Sometimes, such savants can pick up in hours what it took a normal musician a lifetime to learn. It's as if art, music, and math come pre-installed in these people as part of their operating system. They know things they never had to learn. Savant syndrome has been artificially reproduced using a technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation. It passes magnetic pulses through a person's head to turn on their creative potential by switching off their left hemisphere, thus releasing the full power of the right hemisphere, e. it inhibits the left hemisphere and disinhibits the right hemisphere. This thinking cap allows us to become highly literal, to access enormous amounts of detail. It vastly enhances our memory. It triggers mathematical, musical, and artistic skills. It releases the inner savant. Some people can acquire savant syndrome following a head injury or a stroke. The left hemisphere deals with language and logic, and the right with art, math and music, the domains of savant areas of expertise. Savants are thought to have been released from the tyranny of the left hemisphere. In the fetal brain, the right hemisphere finishes its development ahead of the left. Because the left takes longer, it remains susceptible for longer. It has been hypothesized that, in some people, testosterone can impair left brain development in some way, and thus the undamaged right hemisphere has more power and importance than it would otherwise. It's thought that testosterone disrupts wiring in the left hemisphere. The right hemisphere then compensates. This is a left brain society. It's only when the left brain is injured that we see how the right hemisphere functions. Some experts in the field claim that the left hemisphere is selective and deals with big picture thinking, while the right hemisphere is unselective and deals with all of the detail. The left hemisphere inhibits, filters and processes the detail. If we could shut off the left brain temporarily, so the hypothesis goes, we could release right-wing creativity in anyone. A man with no artistic ability suffered a stroke in his left hemisphere and, in the aftermath, became an obsessive artist. Could we find a reliable, convenient technology that makes normal people far more artistic and mathematical by stimulating their right hemisphere and temporarily inhibiting their left hemisphere? The birth of the bicameral mind. But why is there such a mentality as a bicameral mind? Let us go back to the beginning of civilization in several sites in the Near East around 900 BC. It is concomitant with the beginning of agriculture. The reason the bicameral mind may have existed at this particular time is because of the evolutionary pressures for a new kind of social control to move from small hunter-gatherer groupings to large agriculture-based towns or cities. The bicameral mentality could do this since it enabled a large group to carry around with them the directions of the chief or king as verbal hallucinations, instead of the chieftain having to be present at all times. Julian Jaynes Imagine that instead of hallucinating the voice of the chief, the people were genuinely in telepathic touch with the chief. Imagine having a mind space that directly overlaps with the mind spaces of others, so that others can interact with you, and communicate with you without physical proximity. Imagine the analog eye of the chief entering the mind space of others and giving them direct commands. In ant colonies and bee colonies, perhaps the queen directly communicates with her minions via a collective ant or bee mind space. This concept is automatically rejected by science given that science dismisses mind as a reality in its own right. Of course, it can do absolutely nothing to disprove the existence of mind, but acts as though the disproof has already been furnished. The question also arises as to what mentality operated prior to bicameral times. It was almost certainly an autistic mentality, with little or no mind. Space
It can easily be inferred that human beings with such a mentality had to exist in a special kind of society, one rigidly ordered in strict hierarchies with strict expectancies organized into the mind so that hallucinations preserved the social fabric. And such was definitely the case. Bicameral kingdoms were all hierarchical theocracies, with a god, often an idol, at their head from whom hallucinations seemed to come, or, more rarely, with a human being who was divine and whose actual voice was heard in hallucinations. Julian Jaynes Is humanity really so different today? We are still tremendously hierarchical. We have kings and queens, popes and bishops, presidents and prime. Ministers, CEOs and celebrities. People go to a workplace where they have a whole hierarchy of managers whom they feel compelled to obey. We internalize the values of society and conform to them even when no one is around. Another cause is writing itself, because once something is written you can turn away from it and it has no more power over you, in contrast to an auditory hallucination, which you cannot shut out. Writing, weakened the power of the auditory directions. The spread of writing, the complexities of overpopulation, and the chaos of huge migrations as one population invaded others, these are the obvious causes. And in this breakdown, various things started to happen, including I think the beginning of consciousness. Julian Jaynes Yet most people in the past couldn't write, so how important were these considerations for the badly educated? Are the undereducated people of today significantly different from the bicameral people of yesteryear? Stupid people often seem animalistic and not fully conscious. The immediate results of this loss of hallucinated voices giving directions are several and new in world history. The idea of heaven as where the gods have gone, the idea of genii or angels as messengers between heaven and earth, the idea of evil gods such as demons, all are new phenomena. By 1000 BC, people in Babylon were walking around draped with amulets and charms, which they wore to protect themselves from a huge variety of demons. Such charms have been found archaeologically in the thousands dating from this period. Julian Jaynes All of these notions relate to the mind space, and all are denied by science, which is autistically obsessed with the physical space. Atoms are part of physical space. What do they have to do with mind space? Transplanting memories a phenomenon has been reported of transplant recipients taking on personality traits of the donors whose organs they received. A female transplant patient developed an unexpected taste for beer and green peppers following her heart-lung transplant, and she noticed that her handwriting changed drastically. She then had a vivid dream about a young motorcyclist. Later, she learned that the man in her dream was her donor. He had loved beer and green peppers, and her handwriting was now uncannily like his. It has been suggested that memories resulting from transplants should cause scientists to revise their thoughts on the workings of human memory. The implication is that memories are somehow stored throughout the body, and are even present in the transplanted organs. However, another possibility is that by coming into contact with a person's organs, you thereby come into contact with their mind space, which survives death as part of the immortal soul, and hence their thoughts. Memories, tastes, and personality, which might then overwhelm your own, especially if the donor was a more dominant personality type. Parasomnia The term parasomnia refers to all the abnormal things that can happen to people while they sleep. An example is sexomnia, sometimes called sleep sex, referring to sexual acts that are carried out by a sleeping person. Some sleepwalkers are able to perform complex actions, such as driving a car, without the involvement of the conscious mind, which has no knowledge of what took place. If the conscious mind isn't responsible, the other mind must have carried out the task. Sleepwalking during the rapid eye movement phase of sleep can be highly dangerous. Normally, people are paralyzed during REM sleep. In people with REM behavioral disorders, this paralysis does not take place, so victims are able to act out their dreams, which are often violent. A son beat his father to death during a parasomniac episode. The Beginning of Consciousness My God has forsaken me and disappeared, my Goddess has failed me and keeps at a distance, the good angel who walked beside me has departed. Ludlow Belnemeke
And then came the development of a new way of making decisions, a kind of proto-consciousness. All significant decisions previously had been based on the bicameral mind. But after its breakdown, after the hallucinated voices no longer told people what to do, there seemed to have developed various other ways of discerning messages from the gods to make decisions. We call these methods divination. Throwing of lots, the simplest kind, putting oil on water and reading its patterns, dice, the movements of smoke, a priest whispering a prayer into a sacrificial animal, sacrificing it, and then looking at its internal organs to find out what the god intends. All of these were extensively and officially practiced. Julian Jaynes What about the people in the present day who have to consult the Torah, Bible or Quran before they can decide what to do? Are they any better? They too are trying to discern the will of their God. And then the method of divination that is still around, astrology. It is remarkable to go back and read the cuneiform letters of kings to their astrologers and diviners of around 1000 BC. These cruel Assyrian tyrants, who are depicted in their bar leaves as grappling with lions and engaging in fierce lion hunts, are, in their letters, meek and frightened people. They don't know what to do. Astrologers tell them, you cannot move out of your house for five days, you must not eat this, you should not wear clothes today, extraordinary strictures that official diviners would interpret as what the gods meant. It is interesting to note that not only has astrology lasted, but it is being followed by more people at present than ever before. Julian Jaynes Many today people are obsessed with astrology, horoscopes, fortune-telling, psychic mediums, and so on. Muslims believe in genies. In what way then has humanity truly escaped from its bicameral mind of old? Are people genuinely conscious, or only conscious at a superficial level? Do humans still have a long way to go to be authentically conscious? Bicameral humans lacked a well-developed narratizing analog eye to tell them what to do. Instead, they had a God. You cannot be conscious without a strong analog eye. Both autistics and schizophrenics have difficulty constructing an effective analog eye, autistics because they're too wedded to physical space, and schizophrenics because they're too alienated from physical space, and too wedded to mind space. Autistics need to take more drugs, and schizophrenics fewer. As it goes, autistics aren't interested in drugs, while schizophrenics are obsessed with them. By having too much of a relationship with the mind space, schizophrenics open their minds to many other minds, which then overwhelm them. Autistics suffer the opposite problem. They don't open their minds enough. Analysis and Synthesis The left hemisphere processes information analytically. The right hemisphere processes information synthetically. As Jung highlighted, sensing types are the opposite of intuitive types, and feeling types the opposite of thinking types. Sensing types are analytic, intuitive types synthetic. Thinking types are analytic and feeling types synthetic. If we say that the left brain faces the external world, of spacetime, and is objective and analytic, then the right brain faces the internal world, of frequency, of mind space, and is either subjective and synthetic, if the mind deals only with itself, or objective and synthetic, if the mind deals only with other minds. The right hemisphere is also the hemisphere of extreme detail. The autistic brain is highly sensory and has the effect of extracting enormous amounts of data from the right hemisphere, and pressing them into the service of the senses. The schizophrenic brain, by contrast, is highly intuitive and has the effect of extracting enormous amounts of data from the right hemisphere, and pressing them into the service of intuition. So, autistics are extremely good at reading the sensory world, while schizophrenics are extremely good at reading the non-sensory world of intuition, which means tuning into the minds of others. Sadly, this usually has disastrous effects since it drives people mad. Autistics are overwhelmed by physical data, and schizophrenics are overwhelmed by mental data. An overly objective, analytic mind is autistic. An overly objective, synthetic mind is schizophrenic. We need to get a good balance. An overly subjective, synthetic mind is narcissistic and solipsistic. The best analysts actually have extremely good intuition, while the best synthesists are well attuned to spacetime.
The hormone oxytocin, which is produced by the hypothalamus and stored in the pituitary gland, reduces social anxiety and helps to bond people and develop trust and empathy between them. It would be interesting to see how oxytocin levels are dependent on hemispheric dominance. Due to their poor social skills and lack of empathy, do autistics produce lower amounts of oxytocin? Do paranoid schizophrenics also produce lower amounts? 5% of the population do not seem to release oxytocin. These people must be psychopaths. High levels of testosterone appear to inhabit oxytocin production. Aggressive, violent men, awash with testosterone, aren't the bonding type. Releasing oxytocin into prisons could make for a far more peaceful environment. David Hume argued that the roots of morality are in our nature rather than in our reason. He would have approved of an explanation of morality based on a moral molecule, e.g. oxytocin. In fact, true morality is purely rational. Groups bonded by oxytocin are likely to be immoral towards rival groups similarly bonded by oxytocin. Families can hardly be regarded as moral exemplars, can they? Two minds. We can conceive of the existence of two human minds, one directed at a physical space concerned with the physical body, and one directed at a mind space, disconnected from physicality. Just as our individual physical space is connected to the physical space of everyone else, we inhabit a collective physical world, so our individual mind space is connected to the mind space of everyone else, i.e. we inhabit a collective mental world too. Jung famously spoke about the collective unconscious, full of archetypes that influence all of us. If these can reach all of us then, so can the minds of everyone reach the minds of everyone else. Rupert Sheldrake argued that the brain is local physical hardware that accesses non-local mental software that exists within a morphic field, and allows people to access information mentally that would never be available physically. Ancient Dreams Dreams for bicamerals must have been much more intense than for modern people. In fact, they may not have seemed like dreams at all. They may have appeared to provide access to a real, alternative world. Bicamerals may have believed they inhabited two worlds, a man world and a god world, which is why they were so obsessed with religion, unlike so many people today. Can anyone believe that the sort of people in the secular world today could ever be as religious and spiritual as the people of the past? Something has fundamentally changed in their mindset. Muslims are those who seem most in touch with the ancient religious mentality. Bicameralism The theory of bicameralism asserts that the mind has two parts, or, alternatively, that there are two minds operating in conjunction. One mind speaks and commands, the other listens and obeys. Human nature is split in two, an executive part called a god, and a follower part called a man. Neither part is consciously aware in any modern sense, there is no analog I. In effect, so the theory contends, an unconscious part of the mind gave instructions to another unconscious part of the mind via auditory hallucinations. Neither component reflected on anything. There was no introspection. Isn't this executive follower architecture reflective of the master-slave system that pervades so much of the human condition? whereby leaders eagerly command and followers compulsively obey? The idea of God is that of a super-being who commands and must be obeyed. If you are disobedient then, like Adam and Eve, you will be driven from paradise. In a company, if you disobey a manager, you will be fired. Julian Jaynes, who first advanced the theory of bicameralism, said that the bicameral mentality was the normal state of the human mind throughout the world as recently as 3,000 years ago. We can see its commando-based structure everywhere, even today. It hasn't gone. It has simply manifested itself in different ways, through institutions, political systems, philosophies, and, above all, religion and economics. Capitalist wealth is wholly reflective of Bicameralism the rich are the gods to whom everyone else must bow. Jane said that ancient people in the bicameral mode resembled modern-day schizophrenics. Instead of making conscious evaluations, the bicameral person hallucinated a voice or god that gave him commands, which were to be obeyed without question. 
Religions and cults still follow this schizophrenic model of an all-powerful deity that must be slavishly obeyed. The Quran is all about the commands of God, communicated via his prophet Muhammad. There is no sense of Muhammad debating or reflecting on what God says. In exactly the same way, Abraham makes no attempt to debate with God over the extraordinary order to murder his own son. The idea is simple, a higher power has commanded, so must be obeyed. There is no possibility of asking questions, raising moral issues, having a chat with others about it, contemplating its legality and rationality, and so on, i.e. All the things that would occur to any modern human being. Directives are Followed, religiously, literally, and mindlessly. According to James, bicameral cultures were synchronized and held together by shared mass hallucinations of a religious and numinous nature. The right brain communicated with the left brain in bicameral man via verbal hallucinations, and sometimes dreamlike visual hallucinations would occur to grant them even more power. These hallucinations were taken to be real entities, higher powers, gods. That's why humanity is so religiously inclined. In ancient Egypt, the pharaoh was a god on earth. In European monarchies, the sovereign ruled by the divine right. Jesus Christ and many others referred to themselves as the Son of God. In China, the gods were people's own ancestors. The common theme was that a higher order directed the activities of ordinary people. They were not free to take their own decisions. They had to obey without question, without deviation, and it was an enormous taboo to refuse to comply. Even today, we live in societies where inequality is rife. Allowing a few to have extraordinary power and command over the multitude. Since the bicameral mind was not conscious, it was impossible for individuals not to obey. Abraham was incapable of disobeying his God, no matter how appalling the thing that was demanded of him. Here's the fundamental problem. If Satan had spoken to Abraham and ordered him to murder his son, would it have made any difference to Abraham? In other words, would Abraham subject God or Satan to any questioning? If Abraham couldn't be bothered to challenge God about why God was ordering him to murder his son, why would he challenge Satan? Moral questions simply didn't arise in Abraham's mind. How would Abraham even know the difference between God and Satan? Schizophrenia involves thought disorder, delusions, and hallucinations. The victim has a diminished capacity to think clearly and logically, and often uses disconnected, rambling and nonsensical language. Victims therefore cannot communicate properly with others, and they become alienated from friends, family and society. If the victim believes he is being conspired against then he suffers from paranoid delusion. The term broadcasting is used to describe the type of delusion whereby the sufferer believes his thoughts can be heard by others. In fact, all of our thoughts are available to others if we have a shared mental space or collective unconscious. Do we have blocking mechanisms to prevent others intruding into our thoughts? Can these sometimes be overridden? Did this psychic overriding happen all the time in the bicameral age? In a conscious being, there is an unobserved traffic between consciousness and the unconscious mind. In a bicameral individual, there was a non-conscious mental organization based on personae interacting with each other, in particular, the God persona giving orders to the follower persona. In relation to the psyche, Jung spoke about the persona, the ego, the shadow, the anima slash animus, mana personalities and the self. Most of the components of this mental constellation make their contribution unconsciously. However, imagine if all of these different components actually spoke to each other, and no individual component was in overall conscious command. It would be chaos, madness. In the bicameral person, the God always had executive authority. Imagine a person without an I, without continuous narratization. What would their mind be like? Thoughts would simply present themselves. Commands would appear out of nowhere. They might well seem to have an origin in some different order, that of higher beings known as gods. Why? Are human societies so prone to master-slave tendencies unless this structure is somehow built into the human mind itself? 
functional imaging studies show that, during hypnosis, areas of the right hemisphere are activated which are the same areas that, under electrical stimulation, produce the perception of voices and the sense of the numinous. To the person under hypnosis, the commands of the hypnotist seem irresistible. They are accepted without complaint, debate, challenge, or contemplation, just as Abraham accepted God's deadly order to murder his son without objection. Just as no one under hypnosis interrogates the hypnotist, no one under a God's command interrogates the God. For schizophrenics, the inner voices they hear have a numinous quality, in just the same way as the hypnotist's voice is numinous for those under his spell. A hypnotist achieves incredible power through nothing but the authoritative use of words, which are received as divine commands that must be obeyed. Satan Picture by Gustav Dorr Interior Monologue Conscious people are able to hold an interior monologue. Bicameral individuals had no such capacity. They waited for a voice to issue commands regarding all but the most basic tasks. They had no thought of deciding for themselves what to do in any serious situation. This meant that they were certain to be defeated if they came up against opponents with much better and faster decision-making processes. Bicamerals were involved in a dialogue, they prayed to their god for advice, and he then supplied it. They couldn't act without divine guidance, just as Muslims in the present day can't act without checking with the Quran whether something is haram, forbidden, or halal, permissible. According to Jains, human life eventually became too complex to support the bicameral mentality. That way of operating started to malfunction and break down. Dominance switched from the right to the left hemisphere. The analog I appeared. Consciousness replaced voices. Look at how much difficulty Muslim nations have in the modern age. They are in meltdown. They can't cope with modernity. The Quran is not the book you would choose if you wanted to be effective in the 21st century. Ironically, when consciousness first appeared, the first thing the new conscious humans did was attempt to get back in touch with their now silent gods. They used techniques such as divination to try to fathom the will of the gods. They consulted oracles who could supposedly pass on divine messages. They revered prophets who could allegedly channel the commands of the gods. Children are thought to be far more mentally receptive to the gods than adults, especially children with imaginary friends. However, as they mature, oracular children lose their abilities. Authority figures Many people treat authority figures as gods. Stanley Milgram's experiment on obedience notoriously showed that ordinary people could be persuaded to cause serious distress and injury to experimental subjects, who fortunately turned out to be actors. An astonishing 65% were willing to administer what would have proved fatal electric shocks, if they had been real. In his 1974 article The Perils of Obedience, Milgram wrote, the legal and philosophic aspects of obedience are of enormous importance, but they say very little about how most people behave in concrete situations. I set up a simple experiment at Yale University to test how much pain an ordinary citizen would inflict on another person simply because he was ordered to buy an experimental scientist. Stark authority was pitted against the subjects, participants, strongest moral imperatives against hurting others, and, with the subjects, participants, ears ringing with the screams of the victims. Authority won more often than not. The extreme willingness of adults to go to. Almost any lengths on the command of an authority constitutes the chief finding of the study and the fact most urgently demanding explanation. Ordinary people, simply doing their jobs, and without any particular hostility on their part, can become agents in a terrible destructive process. Moreover, even when the destructive effects of their work become patently clear, and they are asked to carry out actions incompatible with fundamental standards of morality, relatively few people have the resources needed to resist authority. This chilling reality is completely consistent with Abraham being willing to murder his own son once the supreme authority, God, ordered it. It seems to reflect a bicameral mentality deeply embedded in people. Abraham was the first to fail the Milgram test. He certainly wasn't the last. Even today, billions admire Abraham and want to emulate his example and worship his God. An enormous number of people are suggestible, 
some of them to an extraordinary degree. Hypnotists rely on the suggestibility of their subjects. What is the hypnotist if not a dominant, a god, he who issues commands that must be obeyed? Hypnotism, no matter how you regard it, is surely one of the most exceptional phenomena you will ever encounter. How can it be explained? Except through an immense natural propensity on the part of ordinary humans to submit to authority, to want to be dominated, commanded, to have responsibility and accountability removed from them? The notorious Stanford Prison Experiments studied the effects of the psychological effects of being assigned the role of either prisoner or prison guard. Those assigned the guard role rapidly became authoritarian and engaged in psychological torture of their prisoners. Many of the prisoners, on the other hand, turned passive, apathetic and compliant, and some, at the request of the guards, actually collaborated with them in harassing any prisoners who attempted to resist the brutal regime of the guards. The academic leader of the experiment, in his role as the superintendent of the prison, permitted the abuse to continue. Others had to intervene to bring the experiment to a premature end. What's the lesson? If you allow people to don the mask of power, to be the God issuing commands, they eagerly embrace it. They even more readily accept the role of people mindlessly obeying commands. They seem to fall into stereotypical master-slave roles with alarming alacrity. Isn't this how the whole world operates? The people in charge are the arrogant, power-mad prison guards, and all the rest of us are their prisoners, who meekly submit to our fate. What's for certain is that humanity clearly has an enormous tendency and appetite for master-slave relationships. There is no sign of any natural force for humans to treat each other as equals by default, to do as you would be done by. The very notion of God's giving irresistible commands, an idea so naturally bought into by so many billions of humans, is the antithesis of equality. Why do you never hear of widespread rejection of the gods and refusal to execute their frequently mad commands? Why didn't Abraham seek out some friends and ask them what they thought of a god who orders a father to murder his child? Why do people so readily accept the unacceptable? Even today, billions call themselves Abrahamists, which means they agree with Abraham's psychotic, murderous decisions and his demented god. The Abrahamic god is the superintendent of prison earth. The popes, rabbis, priests, imams, presidents, prime ministers, chancellors, CEOs, monarchs, lords, nobles, celebrities, police and security chiefs are his prison guards, and all the rest of us are his prisoners, who go along with his psychological torture of us. This can't be any kind of accident. This mentality is inbuilt in us, while the opposite mentality, that of finding gods and their commands ridiculous, and wanting to cooperate with and help each other as much as possible, with as much respect as possible for each other, is alien to us, and rejected. Capitalism is eagerly embraced by the world even though it involves rich masters, those with capital, and dumb slaves, those without capital. Communism is laughed out of court. Why? Because it promotes equality and mutual respect. It seems wholly unnatural and unsuited to the ways of men. However, if ants or bees were constructing a political or economic system, communism would seem the most natural thing conceivable to them. The queen in these colonies is nothing like the megalomaniacal, narcissistic monarchs of the human world. She is the supreme servant of the colony, the individual who works most tirelessly and self-sacrificingly for its success. It's not about her, it's about the colony. This is the reverse of the situation where human monarchs are concerned. It's all about their vanity. Religious people talk about the fall. They say that humans are a fallen, degraded race. In fact, what is most degraded about us is the built-in master-slave bicameralism that afflicts us all, the mechanism that makes us so attracted to gods, leaders, kings, popes, führers, dictators, presidents, chief executives, the super-rich, godlike celebrities, and so on. The human race is all about the alpha leaders and the epsilon followers. Our ape ancestry is all too horrifically apparent. We ought to be able to rationally transcend this archaic heritage, yet we keep embracing it in myriad new and ingenious forms. 
Humanity does not have a future unless it can free itself of master-slave bicameralism, unless it can get rid of false gods and their slavish followers. We have to break out of the prison. We have to escape from the bicameral. Madhouse. The old gods must die. The death of consciousness. Some brain injuries and diseases can lead to the apparent death of consciousness. Victims show no sign of conscious awareness. Dementia sufferers in the final stages seem to have lost all sense of identity. The analog eye has gone. The mind space has disappeared. Humans can function to a degree without consciousness. Just look at sleepwalkers. The bicameral hypothesis is essentially saying that at one time we were all sleepwalkers, except we had an ethereal, dreamy, numinous voice giving us commands about what to do next. Narcoleptics never have a normal sleep. They constantly flick in and out of sleep. With bicamerals, we can imagine that they constantly flicked in and out of hallucinatory states, so that the hallucination and reality seemed like something continuous rather than two distinct states. Whereas normal people cycle through their sleep in distinct, successive phases, narcoleptics go straight into REM sleep. In REM sleep, the brain is active and the body paralyzed. In bicamerals, the paralysis probably did not occur, so they acted out their dreams, which consisted of messages and commands from their gods. Bicamerals probably had much lower orexin levels than modern humans. They did not get activated to the fully waking state associated with consciousness. They were not sufficiently awake to maintain an analog eye that could construct a continuous narrative. Prophets it's easy to dismiss prophets as lunatics. However, if the bicameral thesis is correct then they genuinely were hearing the voice of a god. They were directly reporting what was said to them, so were not despicable charlatans. Of course, what is wholly unclear is the legitimacy of the gods who spoke to the prophets. Was God valid when he ordered Abraham to make a human sacrifice of Isaac? Or was that the voice of the devil? What attempt did Abraham make to resolve this question? None at all. If you can't challenge your God, how do you know if they are benevolent or malevolent? Simulation Why are people so deeply affected by fiction, by characters that have been made up? We often react more powerfully to the fate of a fabricated person than that of a real person. We hurry past vagrants and don't give them a second thought as we rush to discover what happened to our favorite fictional soap character. A fiction is a contrived simulation of reality, and is often designed to exaggerate reality in a way that engages our emotions and thoughts far more powerfully than real life does, which often seems drab in comparison. Fiction allows the construction of a hyperreality that is much more appealing than regular life. Often, real life is incapable of living up to our fictionalization of it. Mainstream religion is another fiction that seems so much more attractive than everyday existence. Some fiction writers talk about how a character of theirs can behave in ways that take them by surprise. It's as if they have created an autonomous person with his own agency. They don't write down in advance what the character says. Rather, they merely record what the character says in response to whatever situation they put him in. Novelist Hilary Mantle spoke of creating a character from such a deep place, so what you have then is a working model, perfect in all its parts, and you can take it out of the situation you first put it in and put it into any situation. It seems to have acquired a life of its own. Did tribesmen create a mental construct of their tribal leader in order to better to understand him and anticipate what he wanted? Did they then run this situation when he was absent? Their simulation was so perfect that it looked and sounded exactly like him. Even when he died, the tribesmen could play the simulation as though he were still there, which would elevate him to the status of a god. In order to empathize with a person, we run a simulation of that person and try to imagine how they feel, and to predict how they will behave in particular circumstances. Autistics seem unable to generate these simulations. Schizophrenics seem too good at producing them. For most of us, our models and simulations operate silently, unconsciously, deep within our minds. However, for some people, particularly in stressful times, 
these models and simulations seem to rise all the way to consciousness and actually speak to us. Meteorologists forecast the weather via a virtual weather system, a simulation of the weather. The system can produce results the forecasters never anticipated. Now imagine prophets simulating God. They run the simulation and it produces outcomes they never anticipated either. It seems like a genuine God authentically communicating with them. Aliens, Subjects and Objects Why do so many people believe they have been abducted by aliens? Do they really mean they have been taken over by their mysterious other? In bicameralism, the follower is much more akin to an object than a subject. The follower does not have his own agency. He doesn't make up his own mind. He waits to be commanded by the God. The God is therefore the subject. When modern consciousness arose, humans were able to become subjects, capable of taking their own decisions. Sadly, most human beings still prefer to obey gods and gurus, hence remain closer to objects than subjects. Memes and Genes For science, evolution is all about the gene pool. No mental changes can take place without genetic changes. If Julian Jaynes is right, mental change has nothing to do with genetic change. The mind space is ruled by memes, not genes. The meme pool is what matters. The meme pool constitutes the culture of society. An inferior meme pool means inferior minds and an inferior society. If we can optimize culture, optimize language, optimize memes, we can optimize human minds and human society. We can make humans more conscious. We can aim for superconsciousness. The human race could be utterly transformed in just one generation. Shame and guilt. Bicameral people belong to a shame culture and conscious people to a guilt culture. Since a bicameral person is not an authentic subject, he cannot experience guilt. He is, however, acutely attuned to public shaming. Shame could lead to a loss of faith in his God since he would feel he was badly advised by his God, or that his God had failed to warn him of trouble. On the other hand, others might re-intensify their faith in their God, in the belief that their God was displeased with them for some reason, hence why their God allowed them to be shamed. When the Jews lost their land, capital and temple to the Babylonians, and were taken in chains to Babylon, they did not blame Jehovah and abandon their faith. Instead, they blamed themselves and became much more fanatical followers of Jehovah. The New Dreamers Modern dreams are profoundly different from bicameral dreams. In modern dreams, we find ourselves moving around in various situations, taking decisions and actions. In bicameral dreams, the dreamer is passive. He is visited by a spirit or God who delivers a message or issues a command. Cultural Consciousness Julian Jaynes argued that consciousness is a cultural construct rather than a physiological development or inherent property of the brain. Let's assume that no genetic changes in the brain were responsible for the transition from bicameral to conscious humans. In that case, an enormous and unprecedented change took place thanks to culture alone, which implies that if we can optimize culture we can optimize consciousness. If we have a harmful, suboptimal culture, it will generate restricted, suboptimal consciousness. Look around. Does the world seem full of highly optimized, fully conscious humans, operating at their maximum capacity? Or the opposite? Are we destroying consciousness via modern culture? Do religions make people stupid? Does scientific culture turn them into materialists and atheists? Does social networking produce stupid narcissists? Are smartphones making people dumb? If culture alone can change the human mentality then the implication is that schizophrenia and autism may be culturally determined, so, if we applied the right sort of culture to schizophrenics and autistics, we could mitigate or eliminate their conditions. Psychiatrist R. D. Lang speculated that schizophrenia was a rational response to crazy family situations, i.e. where the family culture was thoroughly toxic and destructive. He noted that many people got better when they were removed from the family environment, then relapsed when they were returned to their family. 
In these situations, you would have to treat the whole family and their collective culture if you hope to truly help the schizophrenic patient. Gods Many cultures engage in ancestor worship. Imagine the most powerful and glorious of ancestors, those of whom effigies were made. Would they not be converted into gods when they died? Look at the pharaohs. They claimed. They became gods at death. Food for the dead. Why did the ancients bury their dead with food and possessions if they did not think these would be of some sort of use? They must have imagined an analogy between our world and the world of the dead. Why did the ancients have such a fanatical devotion to gods, and total certainty that they existed, if they never once encountered a single particle of evidence for their existence? What made the ancients believe they were conversing with beings who simply weren't there, as far as modern atheistic thinking is concerned? Do humans regularly suffer from mass delusions on a daily basis? If not, why do we imagine that the ancients made it all up? Is the atheistic, materialistic, scientific mindset now the real delusion? The rhizome Life has always seemed to me like a plant that lives on its rhizome. Its true life is invisible, hidden in the rhizome. The part that appears above ground lasts only a single summer. Then it withers away, an ephemeral apparition. When we think of the unending growth and decay of life and civilizations, we cannot escape the impression of absolute nullity. Yet I have never lost a sense of something that lives and endures underneath the eternal flux. What we see is the blossom, which passes. The rhizome remains. Jung. The space-time world of matter is the ephemeral blossom. The frequency domain of mind is the eternal rhizome. The higher self is attuned to the rhizome, the lower self to the blossom. The Internet. At school, people receive lessons from qualified experts. On the internet, people receive lessons from unqualified, braying big mouths, know-it-alls, their equally uneducated peers, trolls, sycophants, mentally disturbed people, conspiracy theorists, activists, lobbyists, and so on. It has been said that on the internet you are having a conversation with a lunatic. Isn't it dangerous that so many people are in constant dialogue with the mad? Superman or Last Man Zarathustra preaches the gospel of the Superman to the people, and the people are silent. He then tries to arouse them by an appeal to their pride and draws the picture of the most contemptible, of the last man, whom they will be unless they overcome their present state. The last man is the man without creative love, without creative imagination, without a desire for anything that is more than himself. What is a star, asks the last man and he is satisfied with his little pleasures and the comforts of his existence. What he wants is, some warmth, some neighborliness, not too much work, protection against disease, a sufficient measure of drugs to create pleasant dreams, liquor, movies, radio, no poverty, the last man is concerned about health and wants a long life. We have invented happiness, say the last men and Lear. Oh, give us this last man, make us these last men. You can have then your Superman, and they laughed. Eric Vogelin, Nietzsche, The Crisis, and The War An interesting question arises in the comparison of conscious men and bicameral men. Were the latter, driven directly by the gods, far more noble, and far more preoccupied with glory and achievement, to please the gods, than modern humans? Were they much more magnificent, and far less selfish? Were they similar to Nietzsche and Superman? Are modern humans self-obsessed, petty, cowardly and sneaky? Are we much more like Nietzsche's contemptible last men? Nietzsche feared that Western man would reject the Superman in favor of the last man, and a cursory look at the modern world fully vindicates him. C.S. Lewis said, If you look for truth, you may find comfort in the end. If you look for comfort you will not get either comfort or truth. The last men always do the latter. Where are the Supermen? The Hallucinators According to Julian Jaynes, the gods manifested to men via auditory hallucinations, and less commonly through visual hallucinations. The Judas Goat A Judas goat is trained to lead sheep or cattle to slaughter, while its own life 
is spared. Was Abraham a Judas goat, and his son the animal to be slaughtered? The Golden Race Very well, and of those who die on campaign, if anyone's death has been especially glorious, shall we not, to begin with, affirm that he belongs to the Golden Race? And shall we not believe Hesiod who tells us that when anyone of this race dies, so it is that they become hallowed spirits dwelling on earth, averters of evil, guardians watchful and good of articulate speaking mortals? We will inquire of Apollo, then, how and with what distinction we are to bury men of more than human, of divine, qualities, and deal with them according to his response. And ever after we will bestow on their graves the tendance and worship paid to spirits divine. Socrates According to Hesiod, there was once a golden race living in a golden age. They have all died, but their spirits live on and they now serve as guardians and guides of mortals. This, then, I think, is what he certainly means to say of the spirits, because they were wise and knowing Hesiod called them spirits and in the old form of our language the two words are the same. Now he and all the other poets are right, who say that when a good man dies he has a great portion and honor among the dead, and becomes a spirit, a name which is in accordance with the other name of wisdom. And so I assert that every good man, whether living or dead, is of spiritual nature, and is rightly called a spirit. Socrates The people of the Golden Age were good people, and, since Socrates linked goodness necessarily to wisdom, he concluded they were wise spirits who gave us wise advice, which we would ignore at our peril. This is a highly bicameral view of reality, if the voice speaks to us, we must assume it is wise, and we must obey it. Socrates himself always obeyed his daemon. So much for the great philosopher. Julian Jaynes, Language and Consciousness It is by metaphor that language grows. Julian Jaynes Human languages don't grow via numbers, logic and reason. Subjective conscious mind is an analog of what is called the real world. It is built up with a vocabulary or lexical field whose terms are all metaphors or analogs of behavior in the physical world. It allows us to shortcut behavioral processes and arrive at more adequate decisions. And it is intimately bound up with volition and decision. Julian Jaynes This implies that our volition and decisions are guided by narrative. We place our behavior in the context of a story we tell ourselves and others. We also read the lives of others as stories. We have said that consciousness is an operation rather than a thing, a repository, or a function. It operates by way of analogy, by way of constructing an analog space with an analog, I, that can observe that space, and move metaphorically in it. It operates on any reactivity, excerpts relevant aspects, narratives, and conciliates them together in a metaphorical space where such meanings can be manipulated like things in space. Julian Jaynes Just as scientists manipulate atoms and wave functions, and mathematicians manipulate numbers and functions, ordinary humans manipulate stories as the functional units of consciousness. Consciousness is simply the language-mediated continuous waking narrative we tell ourselves. Anything without language is not conscious. Anything with impaired language is less conscious. Conscious mind is a spatial analog of the world and mental acts are analogs of bodily acts. Consciousness operates only on objectively observable things. Or, to say it another way with echoes of John Locke, there is nothing in consciousness that is not an analog of something that was in behavior first. Julian Jaynes People cannot make up stories that have nothing to do with the human behavior they have observed in their own lives. For if consciousness is based on language, then it follows that it is of much more recent origin than has been heretofore supposed. Consciousness comes after language. The implications of such a position are extremely serious. Julian Jaynes This is a remarkable and revolutionary point. Consciousness, according to Jaynes, is not biological but cultural. Any creatures that could generate a sophisticated language would become conscious. It also implies that people with greater facility for language are more conscious than others, and, if we wish to produce superconsciousness, we need to create a culture that can support it. The Trojan War was directed by hallucinations. 
and the soldiers who were so directed were not at all like us. They were noble automatons who knew not what they did. Julian Jaynes Jaynes presents the heroes of old as Cartesian animals, zombie robots without consciousness. Their animal instincts were converted into divine commands that they hallucinated. And when it is suggested that the inward feelings of power or inward munitions or losses of judgment are the germs out of which the divine machinery developed, I return that truth is just the reverse, that the presence of voices which had to be obeyed were the absolute prerequisite to the conscious stage of mind in which it is the self that is responsible and can debate within itself, can order and direct, and that the creation of such a self is the product of culture. In a sense, we have become our own gods. Julian Jaynes Jane suggests that we are the god-killers, and that it was necessary for us to be the assassins of the divine in order to gain control of our own destiny. When we became self-mastering, we ourselves were then the gods. The gods were reborn in us. The implication is that we can become even more godlike via the right culture. The language of men was involved with only one hemisphere in order to leave the other free for the language of the gods. Julian Jaynes so, can we learn the hidden language of the gods? Will the secrets of existence reveal themselves to us when we do? The bicameral mind with its controlling gods was evolved as a final stage of the evolution of language. And in this development lies the origin of civilization. Julian Jaynes Humanity is still obsessed with religion and spirituality because it is inbuilt in the architecture of the mind. Isn't it exactly the architecture that God would devise? The king dead is a living God. Julian Jaynes Even today, people have enormous reverence towards fallen heroes of the past, who are now regarded as cultural gods, and who have immense influence on the prevailing cultural narrative. Civilization is the art of living in towns of such size that everyone does not know everyone else. Julian Jaynes and yet we can quickly assign a story to any stranger we encounter, and thus render them familiar. I shall state my thesis plain. The first poets were gods. Poetry began with the bicameral mind. Julian Jaynes The first storytellers were gods. What is the Bible if not the story of men and their gods? Before the second millennium BC, everyone was schizophrenic, Julian Jaynes and prior to that everyone was autistic. By consciousness James means an analog of reality, built from language, Alan Tilly. Yet if reality is not made of language, how can language make an adequate analog of it? Your own voice. Consciousness means listening to your own voice. Bicameralism means listening to someone else's voice. If you let your life be dictated by traditions, parents, family, friends, gods, managers, celebrities, and so on, you are not truly conscious. Anyone who needs a holy book to tell them what to do and how to behave is bicameral. Conscious people can work things out for themselves. They use reason and logic. People who only have a veneer of consciousness look to holy books, sacred scriptures, popes, priests, prophets, pundits, and gurus to tell them what to do. They pray and meditate, and never appeal to reason and logic. What is prayer? It's an act of petitioning a voice, a god, for favorable treatment. It's a holy bicameral activity. What is meditation? It's the act of trying to dissolve the personality and become a living Buddha, god, Brahman, the cosmic consciousness, or whatever. In other words, it's a bicameral attack on consciousness and an attempt to escape from personal consciousness to some divine reality, nirvana. No one who prays or meditates is truly conscious. These people are enemies of consciousness. Islam means submission. Muslims want to submit to the voice. Whether it's that of the Prophet or Allah. The Quran is the word of God. Communicated via the Prophet, and it must be slavishly obeyed. No one is allowed to think for themselves in any mainstream religion or spiritual system. Conscious societies should be taking action against bicameral religions that subvert consciousness. Who is the dream maker? Who gives you your dreams? 
you have them presented to you by someone who is not you. There is no sense that you are actively creating them yourself, especially in the case of nightmares. If you are merely a participant in your dreams, who creates those dreams in which you participate? Isn't it obvious that humans have two minds? At times, both minds have been silent. At other times, both minds have spoken. There was perhaps a time when the right hemisphere spoke and the left hemisphere was silent. Today, the left hemisphere speaks and the right hemisphere is silent. The right hemisphere is called the unconscious. We could just as easily call it the voiceless conscious, i.e. it's conscious but cannot communicate in verbal terms. We have to come to terms with having two independent, autonomous minds. When they are in conflict, they are responsible for irrationality and madness. When they act together, they give us access to much greater insight, power and wisdom. Jung referred to them as the ego and the self. Wikipedia says, the self in Jungian psychology is one of the Jungian archetypes, signifying the unification of consciousness and unconsciousness in a person, and representing the psyche as a whole. The self, according to Carl Jung, is realized as the product of individuation, which in his view is the process of integrating one's personality. For Jung, the self is symbolized by the circle, especially when divided in four quadrants, the square, or the mandala. What distinguishes Jungian psychology is the idea that there are two centers of the personality. The ego is the center of consciousness, whereas the self is the center of the total personality, which includes consciousness, the unconscious, and the ego. The self is both the whole and the center. While the ego is a self-contained little center of the circle contained within the whole, the self can be understood as the greater circle. Jung's scheme is highly bicameral. The self, the center and totality of the psyche, is equivalent to the God in Jane's scheme. The ego, only a small part of the psyche, is the follower in Jane's system. For Jung, the great task is to unite the follower and the God. According to Jung, the self can be projected onto the supreme power in a person's life, such as the state, God, fate, the Fuhrer, the Prophet, the Messiah, or the universe itself. In some cases, the projection is withdrawn and, via an act of megalomaniacal self-inflation, the person believes himself God. Imagine having two consciousnesses, each with its own voice. How would you cope? You would have no choice but to try to bring them into a unity. Imagine that you have a tricky problem to solve and can't work out the answer no matter how hard you try. You go away and do other things for a while. Then, when you return to the problem, you suddenly have the right answer. So, who was it that worked out the answer? You or your other mind? You know what they say, two minds are better than one. Imagine if your dreams could speak to you. Imagine if you didn't have to interpret them. The unfree. None are so hopelessly enslaved as those who falsely believe they are free. The truth has been kept from the depth of their minds by masters who rule them with lies. They feed them on falsehoods till wrong looks like right in their eyes. Goethe. Mainstream religious and spiritual people, and scientific materialists, are all enslaved by false beliefs. They are trapped, and have no idea how to free themselves. We do indeed live in a world of the divine but it's wholly different from how people have conceived it hitherto. Intrusive Thoughts An intrusive thought is an unwelcome involuntary thought, image, or unpleasant idea that may become an obsession, is upsetting or distressing, and can feel difficult to manage or eliminate. Intrusive thoughts, urges, and images are of inappropriate things at inappropriate times, and generally have aggressive, sexual, or blasphemous themes. For most people, intrusive thoughts are a fleeting annoyance. Psychologist Stanley Rackman presented a questionnaire to healthy college students and found that virtually all said they had these thoughts from time to time, including thoughts of sexual violence, sexual punishment, unnatural, sex acts, painful sexual practices, blasphemous or obscene images, thoughts of harming elderly people or someone close to them, violence against animals or towards children, and impulsive or abusive outbursts or utterances. Such bad thoughts are universal among humans, 
and have almost certainly always been a part of the human condition. Wikipedia. It's remarkable how little attention is paid to intrusive thoughts. There are only two possibilities regarding such thoughts. Either they are your own thoughts, which is a highly disturbing notion in itself, or they are someone else's thoughts intruding into yours, which is even more disturbing. How can your own thoughts intrude into your own thoughts? Only alien thoughts can intrude into your thoughts. These thoughts are coming from a second mind, which is why they are so frightening. You are not generating intrusive thoughts. They are coming from somewhere else, yet passing through your mind, where they are unwelcome, strange and alarming. They are the thoughts of the right hemisphere, passing into the left hemisphere by means of, if we need a physical link, the connecting bridge of the corpus callosum. Don't intrusive thoughts point directly to the fact that you are harnessed to another mind thinking different thoughts from you? If these intrusive thoughts become more persistent and start to be associated with a distinct voice ordering you around then you are well on your way to manifesting schizophrenia. In the bicameral age, intrusive thoughts were executive orders that came from the gods and had to be obeyed without question. Abraham was the victim of an intrusive thought that he took as a divine command. Inside Out Inside Out is a 2015 American 3D computer animated comedy drama adventure film produced by Pixar Animation Studios and released by Walt Disney Pictures. The film is set in the mind of a young girl named Riley Anderson, where five personified emotions, joy, sadness, fear, anger, and disgust, try to lead her through life as her parents move from Minnesota to San Francisco and she has to adjust to her new life. Wikipedia Instead of your emotions leading you through life, why not your intuition, or, even better, your reason and logic? Inside Out reveals all too worryingly our contemporary age's sentimental preoccupation with emotionalism. Interestingly enough, no one would ever claim that we should be guided through our life by our senses. Our senses merely inform our emotions and reason. They are not decision-makers in their own right. You might throw a cup across the room because you are angry. You do not throw a cup across a room because your eyes compel you to witness the trajectory of a cup flying across the room. Yet science is entirely predicated on a sensory worldview, with emotions and intuition ignored, and reason accepted only in a sensory capacity, i.e. it is rejected if it arrives at any conclusion incompatible with sensory empiricism. Science reflects the damaging fallacy that our senses are better at revealing truth to us than anything else. In fact, reason and logic are far superior to the senses. Most people, sadly, reject both reason and the senses and place their unshakable faith in their emotions and mystical intuitions. Imagine that instead of being guided by your emotions, as in inside out, you are steered by your higher self or your guardian angel. Socrates always placed his supreme trust in his daemon, just as Abraham did in his God. Abraham's Problem It is no great accomplishment to hear a voice in the head. The accomplishment is to make sure it is telling you the truth. Terence McKenna Bicameralism is all about assuming that the voice in your head is legitimate. All-powerful and telling you the unadulterated truth. When such a voice ordered Abraham to murder his own son, he assumed it was God speaking to him. He didn't stop to question why God would command something so depraved and act so manifestly morally unthinkable. God the Engineer Imagine if God were regarded as an engineer, technologist, scientist, philosopher or mathematician rather than some moral paragon. Imagine if God were concerned with rational and irrational rather than good and evil as the basis of right and wrong. Imagine God stripped of his religious garb. Wouldn't the world be infinitely better and saner? Why is God associated with stupidity rather than intelligence, with story books rather than technical books, with prayers rather than philosophy, with beards and burqas rather than degrees and PhDs? One hemisphere awake, one asleep. Crocodiles can sleep with one eye open, according to a study from Australia. In doing so they join a list of animals with this ability, 
which includes some birds, dolphins, and other reptiles. Writing in the Journal of Experimental Biology, the researchers say the crocs are probably sleeping with one brain hemisphere at a time, leaving one half of the brain active and on the lookout. Jonathan Webb Science Reporter, BBC News Human beings engage in hemispheric sleeping or suppression. During the day, our left hemisphere is dominant, and our right hemisphere inhibited. During sleep, our left hemisphere is much less active, and now the right hemisphere is dominant. What would it be like if we went through life activating one hemisphere and then the other in succession, always keeping one eye open at a time, and switching eye according to which hemisphere is awake? It's a mystery how birds are able to travel for thousands of miles over vast oceans without being able to land and sleep. It has been suggested that birds in flight do in fact sleep by shutting down one hemisphere at a time, leaving the other waking hemisphere to control the flight. If humans could master hemispheric sleeping, we could be 24-7 creatures. Union with the demon Therefore as guardians are appointed for men who have to pass by an unsafe road, so an angel guardian is assigned to each man as long as he is a wayfarer. When, however, he arrives at the end of life, he no longer has an angel guardian, but in the kingdom he will have an angel to reign with him, in hell a demon to punish him. Thomas Aquinas Here, Aquinas suggests that the virtuous unite with their higher self, their angel, in heaven, while the wicked unite with the lowest self, their demon, in hell. In Freudian terms, we would say that heavenly humans unify their ego and superego, while demonic humans unify their ego and id. The language of life. What is the meaning of life? This question has no answer except in the history of how it came to be asked. There is no answer because words have meaning, not life or persons or the universe itself. Our search for certainty rests in our attempts at understanding the history of all individual selves and all civilizations. Beyond that, there is only awe. Julian Jaynes. Therefore, if life, or persons, or the universe are made of a language then they do have a meaning. As it turns out, they are indeed made of a language, but the language of numbers, not of words, i.e. everything is made of mathematics. Mathematics, the ontological force inherently designed to find answers, is the meaning of life. Mathematics is seeking the perfect answer, God. God equals perfect, universal symmetry equals total mental optimization and absolute, effortless power. Every mathematical monadic soul, by finding the exact answer to itself, can be mathematically transformed into a god. Each new stage of words literally created new perceptions and attentions, and such new perceptions and attentions resulted in important cultural changes which are reflected in the archaeological record. Julian Jaynes If we can construct a god language then we can have god consciousness. When we look back at archaeology, we are seeing the evolution of language. Bicameral language leads to bicameral monuments. Modern language produces both functional houses and dreamy skyscrapers reaching for the stars. The Mystery of Consciousness Julian Jaynes argued that ancient peoples were not conscious. If this is right, it ushers in a revolution. It points to the existence of a mental world that has nothing to do with biology, i.e. we can imagine ancient people who were biologically identical to modern people, yet had a wholly different mental apparatus, brought about by cultural rather than biological changes. Jane's thesis is so radical because it offers us the opportunity to transform the nature of humanity via culture. We can aim for a superconscious human race. Consciousness is a much smaller part of our mental life than we are conscious of, because we cannot be conscious of what we are not conscious of. Julian Jaynes In fact, using this argument, consciousness could be close to nothing in terms of our overall psyche. The very reason we need logic at all is because most reasoning is not conscious at all. Julian Jaynes If minds are in fact mathematical, we would not be remotely surprised that most reasoning is not conscious at all. Reading in the 3rd millennium BC may therefore have been a matter of hearing the cuneiform that is, hallucinating the speech from looking at its picture symbols, rather than visual reading of syllables in our sense, Julian Jaynes. 
Ancient humans may commonly have had synesthesia, union of the senses. With this condition, stimulation of one sensory or cognitive pathway leads to an automatic experience in a second sensory or cognitive pathway. For example, auditory hallucinations may trigger visual hallucinations, and vice versa. Closely related to synesthesia is ideasthesia, sensing ideas. Here, concepts can evoke a sensory experience. Where synesthesia involves co-perceiving, associating two sensory elements without reference to the cognitive level, ideasthesia involves linking a semantic, conceptual experience to a sensory experience. Where synesthesia involves one sensory experience triggering another, ideasthesia presumes a sensory experience. Being triggered by a semantic experience. Why do words and ideas have such a powerful effect on us? How can a poem move you to tears and a novel change your life? Can you imagine a computer scanning a book and deciding, as a result, to become a Muslim or a born-again Christian? A computer can't experience ideasthesia. A mind space is a prerequisite for ideasthesia. Ideasthesia is essential to solving the mystery of conscious experience. Ideas and concepts are not mere abstractions, as they would be to a computer. They produce a sensory and emotional response in us, i.e. we don't just read words, we experience them in a bodily way. Imagine you could cause a computer to have different emotional experiences while executing different programs. Would it then become obsessed with running the programs that it found most pleasurable, and avoiding those it didn't like? If a computer couldn't behave in this selective way, but simply executed all programs as if they were identical, how could it ever resemble a human, how could it ever be conscious? How we activate concepts, how we respond to them in emotional and sensory terms, is vital to consciousness. Language is not an abstraction. Language is built into the fabric of our lives. Words can cause us joy, or plunge us into despair. They can wound us to the core, inspire us, and even make us believe in God. Muslim terrorists kill themselves and slaughter others because the words of the Quran inflame them with astounding emotional and sensory anticipation of paradise. Words and ideas are the currency of the analog eye. Ideas have been turned into instruments of pleasure and pain. Ideas change lives more powerfully and surely than anything else. Ideas are therefore objects in the world. They are much more potent than atoms. They have their own laws. They constitute one of nature's most awesome forces. Humans are much more subject to the laws of ideas than they are to the laws of atoms. An earthquake is an immense natural force, yet the Bible has had infinitely more influence over humanity than all the earthquakes and natural disasters put together. Ideasthesia must have a critical bearing on the mystery of how conscious experiences, qualia, emerge within a language system. We don't read words neutrally. They have physiological and emotional consequences for us, to an often overpowering degree, when religion and spirituality are involved. People can kill because of words they've read. Words are anything other than abstractions. How do we experience any physical system, e.g. how do we experience the redness of a red tomato? It's because the mental experience is directly linked to the physical thing. If this weren't the case, we would be having experiences that had no relation to the physical world we find ourselves in. We could experience a tomato as blue, or orange, or purple, at random. In fact, there's no reason why we should even experience the tomato as a tomato. Everything has form and content. The form relates to the thing's mathematical description and the content to the specific experience that accompanies that exact mathematical description. Any object has both primary and secondary properties, the former relating to its mathematical character, form, and the latter to its empirical character, content. This solves the so-called hard problem of consciousness. The universe is based on things that have both form and content. Atoms are forms that carry, in kernel, actual experiences, such as colors, smells, sights, sounds, and so on. Words are conceptual atoms, and these too convey actual experiences, via ideasthesia. 
Ideasthesia is really just another way of saying that all rational form is necessarily linked to empirical content. Everything produces an experience in us. It's impossible to construct a total abstraction that we could encounter and register, but which would produce no experience. Wikipedia says, understanding perception as ideasthesia suggests that the phenomenal experiences evoked by a stimulus are tightly related to the process of categorizing that stimulus and understanding its meaning for the perceiver. That is, experience is created by the process of activating the concept of that stimulus. Therefore, the origin of phenomenal conscious experiences may reside in the mechanisms responsible for extracting the meaning of the surrounding world, including the categorization of stimuli. It is said that synesthetic children associate concrete, sensory-like experiences primarily with abstract concepts with which they would otherwise struggle. Imagine if you had trouble remembering the meaning of the word oxymoron, sharp dull. Wouldn't it be wonderful if, whenever you saw that word, an image of a sharp object positioned next to a dull object immediately flashed up in your mind to remind you? Synesthesia has therefore been proposed as a cognitive tool to cope with the abstractness of much of the stuff we learn at school. We surely shouldn't be surprised that sensing types will have a tendency to try to turn abstractions into concrete sensory experiences, and feeling types to apply a feeling to every abstraction. They have to convert them into something familiar, or the abstractions will remain forever alien, remote and incomprehensible. Only thinking types can handle concepts directly, without any significant need to link them to sensations or feelings. Thinking types are usually much more interested in numbers and logic, logos, than words and stories, mythos. Several researchers have claimed that synesthesia aids the creative process and plays a vital role in novel thinking. The notion is that if we have an unexpected synesthetic response to something, that very unexpectedness generates new possibilities, new avenues, that were previously unavailable. All sorts of new thoughts and ideas can be triggered. Wikipedia says, there are two overall forms of synesthesia, projective synesthesia and associative synesthesia. People who project will see actual colors, forms, or shapes when stimulated, as is commonly accepted as synesthesia, associators will feel a very strong and involuntary connection between the stimulus and the sense that it triggers. For example, in the common form chromesthesia, sound to color, a projector may hear a trumpet and see an orange triangle in space while an associator might hear a trumpet and think very strongly that it sounds orange. Dot. Of course, there is initially no reason for synesthetes to suspect they are unusual. They assume that everyone has the same responses. It's only when they discover that others don't know what they're talking about that they realize they have an unusual condition. Some synesthetes report that their experiences can lead to sensory overload. Is autism a kind of synesthesia leading to autistics being overwhelmed by sensory detail? Synesthetes often say that their condition is a gift, an additional, hidden sense that they would not want to do without. They experience it in a kind of numinous way. Bicameral humans were probably enormously synesthetic and having numinous experiences all the time, which was why they were so religious, and why religion ruled every part of their lives. Synesthetes can use their abilities to memorize names, telephone numbers, long lists, and so on, in much more effective and vivid ways than normal people. Their condition gives them a natural memory palace. With a memory palace, you construct a palace in your mind, full of different rooms, and place the items of any list in the rooms. Then, when you want to recall the list, you simply access your bespoke palace, go through its rooms in order, and find out what you left in each room. Imagine looking at words and seeing the vowels in a different color from the consonants. Synesthesia could allow us to apply much more subtle forms of filtering and discrimination between things than is available to normal people. Synesthetes are much more likely to work in the creative industry. They have a kind of natural creativity, and a different, unusual and quirky take on things. Synesthesia normally involves the unexpected interaction of just two senses. However, a case was reported of one person who experienced synesthesia linking all five senses, i.e. no matter what sensory experience he was primarily having, such as a sight, sound or smell, all of his senses were engaged. 
Imagine what life would be like for such a person, in some ways. Magical, in other ways nightmarish. A common form of synesthesia involves the association of sounds with colors. Sounds such as doors opening can trigger color perceptions. The voices of each of a synesthete's friends might be associated with a unique color, so if a friend standing behind you spoke to you, you would know who it was straight away because of the color you perceived rather than the sound you heard. For some people, musical notes produce colors. Imagine great symphonies of swirling, pulsating color. Wikipedia says, people with synesthesia related to music may also have perfect pitch because their ability to see slash hear colors aids them in identifying notes or keys. Denny Simon sees music on a screen in front of his face. He said, music produces waving lines, like oscilloscope configurations, lines moving in color, often metallic with height, width and, most importantly, depth. My favorite music has lines that extend horizontally beyond the screen area. Synesthetes with spatial sequence synesthesia give numerical sequences. Spatial locations. The number 2 could be far away, the number 7 upside down, and so on. Such a condition is associated with a much better memory. These people can often see months or dates in the space around them. They see time like a clock above and around them, and the same is true of calendars. They don't have to solve any time and calendar calculations. They just read off the answer. Whenever some people think of any number, they immediately and automatically see a mental map of numbers. In the case of auditory tactile synesthesia, Certain sounds produce physical sensations in specific parts of the body. Imagine if hearing the word of God made you feel electrified all over your body. Wouldn't it be the most important factor in your life? With the ordinal linguistic personification variety of synesthesia, ordered sequences, such as ordinal numbers, names of days and months, and alphabetical letters, are associated with male and female personalities. We might say that books such as the Bible and Quran are associated with the personality of God or his prophets. It has been suggested that synesthesia is not a phenomenon of crossed senses, but, instead, that it derives from ideasthesia. The argument goes that individuals are not born with synesthesia but acquire it during childhood at a specific developmental stage, when children come across abstract concepts. For the first time. This is called the semantic vacuum hypothesis. Children struggling with numbers, spatial sequences, letters, and so on, cannot apply an immediate meaning to them, so have to find another means to give them a sense, via invoking one of the physical senses. Non-synesthetes can acquire synesthesia under certain conditions, via, for example, temporal lobe epilepsy, head injury, stroke, brain tumors. Meditation can produce it, as can prayer, deep concentration, sensory deprivation, and so on. Most easily, psychedelics such as LSD can generate it. One fascinating type of synesthesia is that of personality color. When someone with this condition looks at another person, they see an aura. They can tell when the person is sick or healthy by studying changes in their aura. It makes a huge difference if synesthesia is neurological or semantic. In the first case, it is produced by sensory, crossed wires, in the second, it is generated by an attempt to assign meaning to an abstraction. Synesthetic perceptions are spatially extended, i.e. they have a sense of location. Synesthetes talk of looking at or going to a particular place to have a particular experience. Every experience has its own coordinates, so to speak. The extreme sensing mind may well feel compelled to turn every abstraction in an abstract mental space into a concrete experience in an ordered sensory space, a space-time framework. Many synesthetes project their synesthesia outside the body, typically onto a screen in front of their face. It's as if they are converting their abstract mind space into a physical space that exists in the physical world, alongside all other physical objects. In mirror touch synesthesia, individuals observe what is happening to someone else and then summon up the same experience. So, for example, if a synesthete observes someone being tapped on the shoulder, they will feel a tap on their own shoulder, although no one actually tapped it. As you would expect, 
such people have much higher empathy levels than the general population. This form of synesthesia invokes the notion of mirror neurons, which have been independently cited as furnishing a mechanism for empathy. Some research points to synesthesia occurring more frequently in people on the autistic spectrum. That would certainly not be surprising. Severe Autistics may suffer from debilitating synesthesia, complete sensory overload. A vicious circle of sensations automatically triggering other sensations. Misophonia is a neurological disorder. Bad experiences such as anger, fear, hate and disgust are triggered by specific sounds. Can a word on the page, such as demon or devil, haram or halal, produce an extreme visceral response in some people? Are their reactions based on nothing but arbitrary labels used for specific concepts? Why are some people so influenced by holy books and sacred scriptures, while others find them absurd? Misophonia has been called a variety of synesthesia. Wikipedia says, Mirren Edelstein and her colleagues have compared misophonia to synesthesia in terms of connectivity between different brain regions as well as specific symptoms. They formed the hypothesis that a pathological distortion of connections between the auditory cortex and limbic structures could cause a form of sound emotion synesthesia. Such a mechanism could play a vital role in the bicameral mind, giving enormous emotional resonance to everything said by the God. This breakdown in the bicameral mind in what is called the intermediate period is reminiscent at least of those periodic breakdowns of Mayan civilizations when all authority suddenly collapsed and the population melted back into tribal living in the jungles. Julian Jaynes It's an extraordinary feature of history that many civilization went out of business almost overnight. Important sites that were inhabited for hundreds or thousands of years were abandoned in days. People couldn't get away fast enough. They must have feared hell on earth, total anarchy, the absolute loss of divine support and authority. The sites were regarded as cursed and deadly. The importance of writing in the breakdown of the bicameral voices is tremendously important. What had to be spoken is now silent and carved upon a stone to be taken in visually. Julian Jaynes This implies a switch from auditory dominance to visual dominance. What if we moved away from the senses entirely and arrived at rational and logical dominance? The mind is still haunted with its old unconscious ways, it broods on lost authorities, and the yearning, the deep and hollowing yearning for divine volition and service is with us still. Julian Jaynes Most people in the world seem wholly lost. They are desperately seeking gods and gurus. They crave an authority they can have faith in, someone they can believe implicitly and follow without question. Just look at the rise of people such as Muhammad and Hitler. Behavior now must be changed from within the new consciousness rather than from mosaic laws carving behavior from without. Sin and desire are now within conscious desire and conscious contrition, rather than in the external behaviors of the Decalogue and the penances of temple sacrifice and community punishment. The divine kingdom to be regained is psychological not physical. It is metaphorical not literal. It is within not in extenso. Julian Jaynes why do religious and spiritual people seem so bizarre to skeptics, cynics, materialists, and atheists? It's because they have an entirely different mentality, derived from bicameralism rather than consciousness. How can Mosaic law make any sense to a scientist? Every god is a jealous god after the breakdown of the bicameral mind. Julian Jaynes Every god is lost and abandoned. They crave the return of their power and authority. Poetry begins as the divine speech of the bicameral mind. Then, as the bicameral mind breaks down, there remain prophets. Julian Jaynes Prophets are the poets of religion. If we would understand the scientific revolution correctly, we should always remember that its most powerful impetus was the unremitting search for hidden divinity. As such, it is a direct descendant of the breakdown of the bicameral mind. Julian Jaynes Yet why is science so atheistic, so intent on denying hidden divinity? 
The changes in the Catholic Church since Vatican II can certainly be scanned in terms of this long retreat from the sacred which has followed the inception of consciousness into the human species. Julian Jaynes There is no question that Christianity is fleeing from the sacred. That surely spells its doom. I therefore believe that these and many other movements of our time are in the great long picture of our civilizations related to the loss of an earlier organization of human natures. They are attempts to return to what is no longer there, like poets to their inexistent muses, and as such they are characteristic of these transitional millennia in which we are embedded. Julian Jaynes Why should we search for lost gods when we can create new gods, when we can become gods ourselves? No one is moral among the God-controlled puppets of the Iliad. Good and evil do not exist. Julian Jaynes Are good and evil summoned into existence by the words, good and evil? Would anyone know what good and evil meant if the words didn't exist? Did Abraham know these words? Did he care? Didn't he think there was something evil about being ordered to make a human sacrifice of his own son? One does one's thinking before one knows what one is to think about. Julian Jaynes Is anything more remarkable than thinking? We don't make words come to us. They just do, unbidden. Who supplies them? Our other mind? All of these concrete metaphors increase enormously our powers of perception of the world about us and our understanding of it, and literally create new objects. Indeed, language is an organ of perception, not simply a means of communication. Julian Jaynes We construct ideas and then perceive those ideas. Without language, we would be blind to these ideas. Stupid people are blind to the world of intelligent people. They can't see ideas. They can't understand them. The lexicon of language, then, is a finite set of terms that by metaphor is able to stretch out over an infinite set of circumstances, even to creating new circumstances thereby. Julian Jaynes With language, we can build new worlds, worlds of metaphor. Moses Picture by Gustav Dorr British Royalty The British royal family has a limited future. The reason is that they do not understand the concept of royalty. Royals of the past were committed to demonstrating how different they were from ordinary people. They claimed to be the chosen of God and to rule by divine right. People had to call them, Your Highness, Your Majesty, Your Grace, and so on. They wore the most expensive clothes and the most glittering crowns. They had absolute power. People who insulted them were killed. A royal wife who committed adultery was guilty of treason against the state and liable to execution. Everyone had to bow and scrape to royalty, and walk backwards from their presence, with their eyes cast down. The key idea was to emphasize the infinite gulf between the monarch and everyone else. Today, members of the British royal family talk about how normal they are, and what a normal life they lead. Well, if they're so normal, why don't they stop calling themselves royal? They don't want to be seen to have airs and graces, yet that's exactly what royalty is all about. So, now we have the absurdity of the masses being spellbound by the exceptionality and fairy tale elements of royalty, while the royals themselves talk about their own unexceptionality, and how their lives are nothing like a fairy tale, but resemble everyone else's. This is an unsustainable paradox. By Cameral Clothes. When people wear religious clothes day in and day out, they are showing the world that they are bicameral, controlled by the gods. They are not free to make their own clothes choices, as autonomous agents with free will. They are not conscious. They are little more than robots and zombies, being controlled by dead prophets and their dead books and dead words. Bicameral Personalities Different personality types have different types of consciousness. Just as there is an autistic spectrum, there is also a consciousness spectrum. Some personality types are much closer to autism or schizophrenia, bicameralism, than they are to consciousness. Scientists, sensing thinking types, are strongly on the autistic spectrum. They are exceptionally unlikely to hear voices. Mystics, 
intuitive feeling types, are on the schizophrenic spectrum. They may well hear voices. All of the Myers-Briggs personality types sit at different locations on the consciousness spectrum. When you find it extremely difficult to have a rapport with someone, it's because there's too wide a gap between you and them on the consciousness spectrum. You interact with the world, and understand it, in ways that are just too different. The Semantic Vacuum A semantic vacuum occurs when it's difficult for a person to place new information within the context of his existing knowledge. He struggles with the meaning of the new information. He can't find a slot for it in his cognitive schema. Stupid people permanently suffer from a semantic vacuum. They struggle to make sense of new ideas. Why do so many people still believe in ancient superstitions such as Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism and Taoism, and reject modern mathematics, science and philosophy? It's literally because they are too ignorant, too intellectually challenged. They can only buy into a simplistic mental schema based on widely accepted stories. Adults reject anything to which they can assign no meaning, no place in their existing schema. Children are compelled by the education system to make an attempt. It has been proposed that synesthesia, or ideesthesia to be more precise, comes about as a desperate means to assign meaning to an abstract idea that would otherwise, to a sensory person, be meaningless. A word such as Tuesday is an abstraction to an extreme sensing type. It's impossible to see or feel a Tuesday. Certain children respond to this semantic vacuum by adding concrete, sensory-like experiences to such abstract concepts. They give a day a specific color, or smell, or taste, or visual symbol, or spatial location. They can then integrate it with other sensory objects in their sensory schema. Synesthetic experiences make abstract information concrete by serving as sensory rather than verbal labels. Why is mathematics so difficult for most people? because it's far too abstract, far too different from everything else in their schema for comprehending the world. Science, which is largely based on mathematics, can of course talk about atoms. It can refer to objects, observations, experiments. It can engage the senses. Science is, in fact, simply mathematics subjected to the philosophy of materialism and empiricism. It's sensory. Mathematics rather than mathematics based on pure reason and logic, with no need for the senses. The syntactic vacuum. Just as there is a semantic vacuum, there is also a syntactic vacuum, but this is much more subtle than the former. People are obsessed with meaning, but only in the context of their experiences, i.e. they are natural empiricists. They are, however, anything other than obsessed with abstract syntax which often involves the manipulation of nothing except symbols and numbers, i.e. they are not natural rationalists. Yet what conveys meaning if not syntax? Meaningful information does not exist in a vacuum. Something that is not semantic must convey the semantic data. Meaning does not convey itself, otherwise everything would be self-evidently meaningful. The meaning of a sentence is something that has to be extracted from the sentence syntax. There is no meaning without the syntax. This simple point seems to have been missed by almost everyone, including many of the greatest intellectuals in history. Philosopher Rudolf Carnap said that all philosophical problems were really syntactical. Many statements that appear meaningful are shown to be meaningless when you subject them to a proper syntactic scrutiny. The bicameral mind is preoccupied with semantics, with the meaning of experiences. It's emphatically an empiricist rather than rationalist mind. The conscious mind, on the other hand, is one that is moving towards a preoccupation with syntax. Philosophy, logic, science and mathematics drive modern consciousness and these are very much about syntax, about the manipulation of technical symbols and functions, often wildly divorced from our day-to-day -day experiences, that are opaque to ordinary people, who therefore lack this kind of consciousness. Philosophers, logicians, scientists and mathematicians are the people furthest from the, the voices of the bicameral age. Followers of Abrahamism and Eastern religion are, conversely, worryingly close to the bicameral gods of old. These people are barely conscious at all, which is why they look back to ancient religions born in and just after the bicameral age. 
Islam is supposedly part of the modern age of consciousness, but is in every way a classic bicameral religion, it begins with a lone prophet in a cave hearing a voice. Joseph Smith, founder of Mormonism, is clearly a bicameral figure, or total charlatan and conman pretending to be bicameral. Wikipedia says, Smith said that in 1823 while praying one night for forgiveness from his sins, he was visited by an angel named Moroni, who revealed the location of a buried book made of golden plates, as well as other artifacts, including a breastplate and a set of interpreters composed of two seer stones set in a frame, which had been hidden in a hill in Manchester near his home. Smith said he attempted to remove the plates the next morning but was unsuccessful because the angel prevented him. Smith reported that during the next four years, he made annual visits to the hill but each time returned without the plates. Followers of religion and spirituality are much less conscious than philosophers, scientists and mathematicians. The former are eager to be commanded by voices, by prophets and gurus, by holy books and sacred scriptures, by their unconscious. They emphatically do not look to reason. Logic, scientific experiments, mathematics and philosophical thought. Experiments. They like to kneel, pray, and meditate, not to read books. Equally, many scientists are in fact deficient in terms of consciousness because they are firmly on the autistic spectrum and have a restricted mind space. Consciousness is directly tied to syntax. The more you comprehend syntax, the less reliant you are on voices. You can reflect the means by which existence itself constructs its sentences, i.e. you can align yourself with nature's syntax. You don't need voices to tell you what to do. What is the subject least liked by humanity? Mathematics. What is the most syntactic language? Mathematics. What is the subject furthest from bicameralism, voices and gods? Mathematics. Are you getting the picture? Mathematicians are the most conscious people in the world, those closest to reality in itself. The Oblivious Frog If you put a living frog in a saucepan filled with water at room temperature, then slowly turn up the heat, the frog will fail to notice that it is being boiled alive. How do we know that we are not human frogs, and the powers that be have not been turning up the temperature on us for millennia? The ancient prophets, with their ancient words, are still cooking by camel people even today. High Cuisine If you put the finest steak in your dog's food dish and dog food on your own plate, the dog will ignore the steak in the hope of having what you're having, the master's food, which is surely much more delicious. If the super-rich started eating dog food in the most exclusive restaurants, if dog food got rave reviews from the top celebrities, if eating dog food demonstrated that you belonged to a higher class than other people, wouldn't the masses immediately clamor to have dog food and turn up their noses at the best steaks? So, what's the difference between humans and dogs? Right and left. The great pleasure and feeling in my right brain is more than my left brain can find the words to tell you. Roger Sperry. When weak but complex magnetic fields are applied to the right hemisphere of the brain, they produce euphoric, blissful and mystical experiences. They have no such effect on the left hemisphere. When people take psychedelic substances and achieve altered states of consciousness, it's the right hemisphere that is affected. The drugs have no impact on those who have lost the use of the right hemisphere. In Australia, Professor Alan Snyder at the center of the mind has studied the effect of temporarily shutting down the left temporal lobe of the brain using his technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS. Suppression of the left hemisphere enhances artistic and mathematical ability and leads to improved memory. Snyder says he has produced a creativity amplifying machine. He claims that TMS can make people see the raw data of the world as it is. The left hemisphere filters and processes it, producing a big picture. TMS gives an insight into autistic savants and those who have suffered left hemisphere damage. Daryl Trefford, an expert on savant syndrome, said, I've come more and more to the conclusion that rather than there being right hemisphere compensation for left hemisphere damage, there is rather release from the tyranny of the left hemisphere. In the bicameral age, it was the right hemisphere that was the tyrant. 
It wasn't genes but culture that brought about the transition to left hemispheric dominance. When a stroke damages the right hemisphere, the left hemisphere is released from the right's influence, often leading to a condition called anosognosia. Anosognosia, without knowledge of disease, is a deficit of self-awareness. This is a condition in which a person who suffers from a disability seems unaware of the disability and actively denies any such disability. When a right hemisphere stroke causes paralysis in the left side of the body, an anisognosiac denies any paralysis. They may say that their paralyzed left arm belongs to another person, or say, I don't feel like moving my arm right now, to explain away why they can't move it. It's called confabulation when a person who is lying, as far as others are concerned, is convinced he is telling the truth. Confabulation is about the formation of false memories, perceptions, and beliefs. Do normal people routinely engage in confabulation? Do they create false realities and then believe in them as if they are true? Are religious beliefs all about confabulation? The left hemisphere seems to be able to invent stories that deny basic reality. It can lie relentlessly. It has no inherent reality principle. It can exist in a permanent state of denial and false consciousness. This is where the analog eye lives. Its job is to construct a continuous story, but there's no obligation for it to be a true story. That would explain most of human history, the history of the lie. Doublethink Doublethink is the act of simultaneously accepting two mutually contradictory beliefs as correct, often in distinct social contexts. Doublethink is related to, but differs from, hypocrisy and neutrality. Somewhat related but almost the opposite is cognitive dissonance, where contradictory beliefs cause conflict in one's mind. Doublethink is notable due to a lack of cognitive dissonance, thus the person is completely unaware of any conflict or contradiction. Wikipedia Are the right and left hemispheres in a condition of doublethink or cognitive dissonance with regard to each other? Can the hemispheres accept having different thoughts, attitudes, and beliefs, or does it cause them dissonance, which they then feel compelled to resolve? Are some people prone to doublethink, while others are subject to cognitive dissonance? Bicameralism versus consciousness People who have strong bicameral tendencies kneel, pray, and meditate. They don't use reason and logic. They wear religious clothes. Conscious people study mathematics, science and philosophy. They use reason and logic. They don't wear peculiar clothes. Two minds are better than one. Isn't it obvious that we always need two minds? If our mind is paying attention to something, what is paying attention to all the things we're not paying attention to? Imagine how vulnerable we would be if we had no means to be aware of anything other than what we were paying attention to. It would be the simplest thing for predators to distract us with anything that grabbed our attention, then attack us and kill us while we were looking the wrong way. We need a hidden observer, a second mind, that is paying attention to everything we're not paying attention to, and can tap us on the shoulder, metaphorically, to alert us to anything important. Why is it that we suddenly get a feeling that someone is staring at us? Sure enough, when we look up, we catch the person in the act. But how did we know what they were doing? We must have a second mind that has a much more expansive awareness field than our normal consciousness. Why shouldn't this second mind belong to another being? How can one being have two independent, autonomous minds with their own agency? Doesn't it make much more sense for two beings to be involved, a human with a local, space-time, mentality, and an angel with a non-local, frequency, mentality? In the past, in the bicameral age, the angel spoke and was dominant. Now, the man speaks and is dominant. What was Jesus Christ if not a single being with two minds, a man-mind and a god-mind? We are all made in Jesus' image, we are two mind beings, and that means we are two persons in one. Traditional Christianity teaches the doctrine that the one person Jesus Christ had two natures, divine and human. But why should these separate natures not be separate persons, one divine and one human? After all, the Christian doctrine of the Trinity involves three persons in one God, with a single divine nature. 
Some early Christians concluded that Jesus possessed two minds, a human mind and a divine mind. This, in fact, is the only logical way in which Jesus could have been both man and God. Why should we not think of Jesus as a human man, a local being in spacetime, bonded to God, a non-local being in the immaterial frequency domain outside spacetime? And why should we not conclude that all spacetime creatures are likewise configured, i.e. they have a supernatural being, by which we simply mean a being outside the domain of spacetime and matter, and not anything spooky or mystical, directly linked to them, as daemon to idolon, as spirit body to natural body, as self to ego, as higher self to lower self, as guardian angel to human being. As soon as you accept that reality comprises two domains rather than one, the spacetime domain of matter and the immaterial frequency domain of mind, it makes perfect sense for all beings to be dualistic, straddling both domains. Everyone is a hybrid, a cooperative partnership. One being looks after the physical domain and the other the mental domain. At some times in history, the mental being, angel, has been in charge, at other times the physical being, man, has taken over. Both the glory and madness of the human condition lies in this mind-matter bifurcation, and the struggle for dominance between man and angel. This hypothesis makes perfect sense of the evolution of human consciousness, of humanity's obsession with the religious and spiritual, with gods and devils. We are not one, we are two. Today, the second person, the angel, is for the most part unconscious and silent. Previously, it had a voice and may even have been where our proto-consciousness resided. Four types of human are possible. Unconscious human, unconscious angel. This configuration could support primitive autism or primitive schizophrenia, the latter being what Julian Jaynes called bicameralism. Dot. Unconscious human, conscious angel. This would be a much more powerful form of bicameralism. Conscious human, unconscious angel. This is the way things are in the present day. Conscious human, conscious angel. This would lead to insanity unless the two were able to merge into a single entity, the Ock, the transfigured self that has undergone apotheosis. All of us really do have a higher self. We really can reach a much higher state of evolution. We can all become divine. Angels exist. Angels exist. In fact, they're us. Or, rather, they are our higher selves. Unfortunately for us, our consciousness is located in our lower self, the part that is much closer to the beasts than to God. That's why so many people find this world hell rather than heaven. Hell isn't other people. Hell is us. Equally, we are capable of being heaven, if we make full contact with our higher, angelic selves. People wonder about consciousness. God used angels to make humans conscious. We are called the fifth ape. Well, the other four apes aren't conscious. Why not, if consciousness is so valuable in evolutionary terms? What else does it mean for man to be made in God's image if something of God is not included in man? Our divine connection is supplied through angels. Humans have both a human and angelic nature in one body just as Jesus Christ had both a human and divine nature in one body. The angel is what is known as our guardian angel. Socrates called it his daemon and swore by it for all of his important decisions. Julian Jaynes introduced the extraordinary insight that humans were once bicameral. Jaynes claimed that, just a few thousand years ago, humans were not conscious. Instead, they had an executive part that gave commands, and a follower part that instinctively obeyed those commands. The executive was called a god, and was worshipped by the follower, the man. According to Jaynes, this dualistic structure was the origin of all human religions and spiritual systems. There are two domains in the universe. One is the scientific domain of space, time and matter. This is called the temporal domain, the domain of mortals. It's a local domain, where everything is separate from everything else. The second is an immaterial domain outside space and time. This is a singularity, made of frequencies rather than matter. This is called the eternal domain. 
since it's indestructible, it's the domain for all immortals. It's a non-local domain, hence everything is interconnected. It cannot be understood by science since it stands outside the scientific paradigm. It's a nominal, non-sensory domain that experiments cannot reach. It is, however, completely understandable via God's perfect, eternal, infallible language of nature, mathematics. This is a mind-matter universe, not a matter universe. Humans are connected to both domains, via our guardian angels, our higher selves. Isn't it time to understand the true nature of reality, the true nature of consciousness? Isn't it time to learn the secrets of the angels? Isn't it time to fulfill your dreams by releasing your own inner angel? Become the glorious being you were always intended to be. Once you understand the nature of God's angel experiment, you will understand what you are supposed to do with your life. You will at last know the meaning of your life. Don't listen to the naysayers and the scoffers. These people are imprisoned by their lower selves. They are the jailers of our world, keeping the rest of us imprisoned in a false reality. Goethe said, none are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. It's time to be truly free, and that can be accomplished only by raising lower to higher, by merging with your guardian angel, your personal connection to the divine. A human body is but a chrysalis. The human, the true human, is destined to undergo a complete metamorphosis and emerge with wings, as a radiant angel. You yourself are part of the divine experiment. The Angelic Higher Self Picture by Gustav Dorr How God Made Humans Conscious God used angels to make humans conscious. What does it mean for man to be made in God's image if something of God is not included in man? The divine connection that humans have with God is supplied through angels. Humans have both a human and angelic nature in one body, just as Jesus Christ had both a human and divine nature in one body. The angel is our guardian. Socrates called it the daemon and swore by it for all of his important decisions. Julian Jaynes introduced the extraordinary insight that humans were once bicameral. Jaynes claimed that, just a few thousand years ago, humans were not conscious. Instead, they had an executive part that gave commands, and a follower part that obeyed those commands. The executive was called a god, and was worshipped by the follower, the man. According to Jaynes, this was the origin of all human religions and spiritual systems. There are two domains in the universe. One is the scientific domain of space, time and matter. This is called the temporal domain, the domain of mortals. It's a local domain, where everything is separate from everything else. Then there is an immaterial domain outside space and time. This is a singularity, made of frequencies rather than matter. This is called the eternal domain. Since it's indestructible, it's the domain for immortals, for souls and God. It's a non-local domain, where everything is interconnected. It cannot be understood by science since it stands outside the scientific paradigm. It's a nominal, non-sensory domain. Scientists perform experiments with atoms. God performs experiments with worlds and angels. This is a mind-matter universe, not a matter universe. Humans are connected to both domains, via our guardian angels, our higher selves. Isn't it time to understand the true nature of reality, the true nature of consciousness? Isn't it time to learn the secrets of the angels? Human Destiny Picture by Gustav Dorr Conclusion If God wanted to bring humans to perfection so that they could share paradise with him as equals, as beings of free will who had chosen to be there, how would he do it? Wouldn't he invoke a mechanism such as bicameralism? In the early days, in the Golden Age, Eden, God himself was the voice directing humans. Later, he delegated the task to angels. His idea was that both the angels, adults, and the humans, children, would benefit from the exercise. In the end, the angels and humans would become single beings, fully merged with each other, Ka and Ba united to form the Ak. In Jungian terms, the human is the ego and the angel is the self. 
When ego and self are perfectly bound together, the result is a being with free will that is fit to sit in the company of God. In Chariots of the Gods, Unsolved Mysteries of the Past, Eric von Daniken speculated that ancient civilizations came into contact with astronauts who were welcomed as gods. Visitors from other planets were, therefore, in this view, the source of humanity's religious beliefs. The astronauts, so the argument went, also gave us the knowledge and technology to produce the great monuments of the ancient world, including the Egyptian pyramids, Stonehenge, and the statues of Easter Island. The Nazca lines in Peru were explained as landing strips for an airfield. Ezekiel's vision of angels and wheels was interpreted by von Daniken as the description of a spacecraft. The Ark of the Covenant was explained as a communications device for contacting aliens, and the destruction of Sodom by fire and brimstone depicted as a nuclear explosion. In fact, humanity was guided not by astronauts but by angels. Are angels any less likely than alien visitors? Behind them all stood God himself, the great experimenter, the cosmic engineer of the soul. We all have a divine future. We shall all take our places in the chariots of the gods. We shall boldly travel to the stars, and beyond to paradise.